Since 1971, over 30 women have disappeared along a 50-mile stretch of I-45 between Houston and Galveston, causing some to refer to this little patch of South Texas interstate, officially known as the Gulf Freeway, as the highway to hell. Ex-DAA agent Don Farrone, the man who wrote the screenplay for the 2011 film loosely based on a few of these murders, Texas Killing Fields, Farrone told reporters for a CBS 48 Hours mystery investigation into the crimes that there even used to be a sign on a bridge as you drove into the Killing Fields area that read, You are now entering the cruel world. He also said that the land around this lonely stretch of asphalt is just a perfect place for killing somebody and then getting away with it. In addition to the women whose bodies have been found, many additional women, believed to have also been murdered, have gone missing from the area since the 70s. National interest in these murders began when, between 1983 and 1991, four female corpses were all found on the same 25-acre patch of land that sits in the heart of all these killings and disappearances. The undeveloped land the bodies were found on, an old League City, Texas oil field, is located about a mile from Interstate 45. It borders the Calder oil field, These acres of brush and marshland are hidden behind the Little Magnolia Creek Baptist Church on Calder Drive in Leake City, an outer southern suburb of Houston that only had 10,000 people in it in 1970, but has exploded to a population of over 100,000 now. And the press began referring to these 25 acres as the Texas Killing Field, singular, in early 1986 when police found the remains of two missing women on the same day, February 2nd. The first body, which for decades was known as an unidentifiable Jane Doe, just recently identified this past April through genealogy testing as Audrey Lee Cook, a 30-year-old mechanic. The second body belonged to a 16-year-old local Clear Creek High School sophomore, Laura Lynn Miller. And Audrey's remains were found just 50 yards from where the body of a 23-year-old cocktail waitress, Hedy Fye, had been found two years before in 1984 after a dog carried her skull to a nearby home. And in 1991, the remains of a fourth woman, who remained another Jane Doe until this past April, now known as Donna Prudhami, a 34-year-old mother of two, were found no more than 100 yards from the three other bodies. And all four women's remains seem to have been arranged in the same way, laying on their backs, nude, with their arms crossed over their chest. Were they the victims of the same killer? We're going to look into that today. And in the houston Galveston area, around this initial killing field, bodies had been turning up for years before the press gave the 1980s and the 1991 murders a catchy title. In the 1970s alone, the bodies of 11 murdered girls and young women were found. Another 13 bodies, including three I just mentioned, were found in or not far from the League City killing field in the 1980s. Then in the 1990s, another 12 women and girls were killed in the area, including the already mentioned Donna Prudhami. And a few additional girls were abducted abducted and or assaulted, but managed to escape. And then an additional five female bodies were discovered between 2001 and 2006. So many bodies have been found in various marshes and swampy fields along I-45 that the whole 50-mile stretch of Gulf Freeway, the highway to hell, has become known to many as the plural Texas Killing Fields. Will more bodies be found in the Texas Killing Fields? Who is killing all these women? Is someone still killing women in this area? Most likely, the women were killed by multiple murderers, at least a few of whom were very possibly serial killers. We have several strange, creepy suspects to go over today, some of whom were eventually found guilty of some of the Killing Fields area murders, and at least one suspect was very likely wrongly convicted. Other suspects seem to have gotten away with some murders. One dirtbag may have kept killing in the area after going on the run when he was able to post bond after killing a man who tried to keep him from driving away after he jumped out of a red and white GMC pickup, nude from the waist down, and began masturbating in the street in front of some young children. The world has never had a shortage of dirty birds, and we look into many of them and examine way too many killings in today's true crime smorgasbord mystery edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) Work can wait meat sacks. It's called to the curious time. Time for Time Suck. I'm Dan Cummins, Nimrod's ball sack masseuse, lover of both Lucifina and fruit, lowly human fire hydrant of Bojangles, and you are listening to Time Suck. Recording again in the Suck Dungeon here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where summer continues to be beautiful. I might get a little sweaty today. I've been, I've been pounding a, a honey lavender latte. It is so good, but maybe not smart on a hot day to pound a very hot drink. Hail Nimrod, Lucifina, Bojangles, and the sweet bar of the suck, Grammy-winning recording artist Michael Motherfucker McDonald, 
who I'll be watching again this summer at Quest Casino just outside of Spokane. And speaking of area shows, if you are a local Coeur d'Alene or Spokane area sucker, my barber, the awesome and talented Michael from Mavericks Men's Hair, is hosting a special screening of, a, of the kick-ass Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze film Point Break with a Q&A with special guest Robert Levy, the man who produced Point Break and other films like The Wedding Crashers, Smokey and the Bandit, and more. All happening at the Innovation Den in Coeur d'Alene by Coeur d'Alene Coffee at 418 East Lakeside Avenue, right downtown. This is not a paid promotion. I just love Michael, love that movie, and love that all the proceeds are going to the Children's Village and Sorensen Music School program. So it should be fun. All going down this Wednesday, June 19th at 6 p.m. I may stop by. Depends on some other family stuff I have going on, so I can't commit 100%, but I want to go. Take a link in today's episode description. It's an Eventbrite uh, little event if you want to just look there for yourself. Also excited again to announce that, uh, you know, our Patreon supporting Space Lizards, thanks to them, we're, we're able to give $2,400 this month to the National Alliance to End Homelessness, nonprofit organization whose sole purpose is to end homelessness in the U.S. To donate more yourself, find out more about their organization, go to endhomelessness.org. Link again in the episode description. And that donation deserves a celebration. Did you, did one of you, uh, uh, wait, did one of you just ask for an air banjo rendition of Yamo Be There? I, I feel it. I felt it in my soul. Okay. All right. Wish granted. Bank don't tank tank. Bank tank tank um tank don't tank tank. Bank tank tank um tank don't tank tank. But I'm tank don't 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 tank uh, but sir, got a new ridiculous product in the Time Suck store. Uh, we have a Dan's Nanocart t-shirt because I have no pride or self-respect. Yes, we have made a shirt in honor of banana peel I f- fucked in a high school uh, grocery store bathroom. Luckily, the shirt looks very innocent. Just, just a little old Nanocart. No big whoops. Nothing sexy about it. No one's getting turned on. No one's getting rock hard. And these shirts come with the roll of 15 little Nana stickers. For real. You know those little Chiquita stickers that you find on bananas? Well, these are very similar looking. The same size, the same color layout, little parody of these. They're Dan Keita stickers. <laughs> and they have the hashtag sexy fruit printed on them. Showbiz. That is how they do it in Hollywood. And the next time you're at the grocery store, please swap out a Chiquita sticker or two with the Dan Keita sticker. Leave it there. <laughs> Take a pic. Hashtag it with sex fruit so we can find it and laugh our silly fucking asses off. The Nana Cart shirt is a mint colored Bella 100% cotton tee made out of 100% testosterone. 500% clean ween. Energy and a thousand percent meat, bigger to medium, medium to small uh, dick energy. I'm talking about stickers. Check out Time Suck Podcast on Instagram to see so many Time Suck Street Team stickers spread around the country. It's fucking great. Hashtag spread the suck. Uh, I'm on a short break from the Happy Murder Tour now, or I will be when you hear this. I'm recording this before Raleigh. Hope I had fun in Raleigh. The tour will pick up again in Cincinnati, July 26th and 27th. I'll be at the West Liberty Funny Bone. August 1st, 1st through the 3rd, excuse me, I'll be at the Comedy Zone in Charlotte, North Carolina. August 4th, bounce over to the Funny Bone in Richmond, Virginia for one show. August 9th and 10th, Orlando Improv. August 11th, live time suck at the Orlando Improv. The Ant Hill Kids again. More tour dates at dancummins.tv, Los Angeles, the Comedy Store, San Diego Comedy Store, Portland at Helium, and more. Soon I'll be announcing that tickets go on sale for a show at the Minneapolis 10,000 Laughs Comedy Festival and for a new special taping in Detroit in October. And now I have an interesting tale for you today. And some interesting Time Sucker updates at the end. Love that so many of you took me up on re- my request to send in ideas about how we're supposed to solve the homeless situation in America. So much suck today. So much show. This latte is going to keep it going. And now it is. True crime time. Honey, lavender latte, don't talk too fast. I got to tell myself that inside for the rest of the show. Got a lot of cold cases, a lot of solved cases to go over today. Going to talk a bit about Matthew McConaughey. Now his career was sort of kind of launched by these murders. I don't know if that's how he would see it, but you will learn the real story of what I'm talking about. How, how uh, Texas Killing Fields and McConaughey's acting career are actually intertwined in an interesting way. I love random trivia, and this is a good piece of random trivia. Uh, this suck will be somewhat reminiscent for you weekly suckers of the alphabet murder suck from this past December. Just like in that episode, we have a variety of dirt bags to look into today. Uh, a, a creep cornucopia, if you will. One guy who the real killer or killers never met who spent virtually his entire adult life in prison because of these murders and more. 
I don't normally shout out a specific source because we use a lot of different sources each and every suck. And we did use a lot of different sources this week as well. Especially though that in Texas, you can look up anybody behind bars very easily and find out how much longer they're going to be in when the release date's coming up, all that stuff. Uh, but really, uh, really leaned heavily on crime author Catherine Casey's Deliver Us Three Decades of Murder Redemption in the Infamous I-45 slash Texas Killing Fields. It's a book published in 2005, fantastic resource. I don't know, Catherine. Again, not sponsored. I just... Uh, very thankful to have that resource because without it, this would have been real, real tricky to put together. Uh, the best way to attack today's topic is for sure chronologically. So let's just uh, let's just get to that and let's kick off a long, dark time suck timeline right now. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. We begin our timeline in 1971, the year that Three Dog Nights, Joy to the World, was the number one song in the country of, of all songs that entire year. A song that, in my opinion, has not held the test of time. Uh, so have fun trying to get this out of your head today. Jeremiah was a bullfrog, Donna was a good friend of mine. I never understood a single word he said, but I helped him a drink his wine. And it always has some mighty fine wine. What the fuck are you talking about, Three Dog Night? And then the chorus that will never leave your head. He's singing joy to the world. All the boys and girls. Now joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea. And joy to you and me. How stoned were they when they wrote that song? <laughs> Another verse reads, you know I love the ladies, love to have my fun. I'm a high life flyer and a rainbow rider, a straight shooting son of a gun. I said, a straight shooting son of a gun. What is this song about? <laughs> Drinking wine with a bullfrog, making love with the ladies. I think mostly it's about drugs. Uh, a lot of the joy down between Houston and Galveston would go away in 1971, the year of the initial killing. Uh, the press and detectives have lumped into the Texas Killing Fields murders. The killings began in little Alvin, Texas in 1971, when Alvin was a sleepy little South Texas town of just over 10,000 people, about 15 miles or so from Galveston Bay in the Gulf of Mexico, a little over, excuse me, a little over 10 miles west of I-45 and around 10 miles from the League City Killing Field that serves as a kind of central ground zero of sorts for all these murders today. I'll be referencing how far the other murders are from the League City Killing Field a lot because that's kind of right in the middle of when all this stuff, uh, where all this stuff happened. Alvin was originally a railroad town, settled when the Santa Fe Railroad first bounced on through, you know, uh, down to the, to the coast in Texas. It was also a sundown town, at least as recently as the 1930s, a town where African-Americans were not allowed to live, where local politicians passed laws and ordinances that made it possible or impossible, excuse me, for black citizens to buy a home, shop at local businesses, or really do anything other than just quickly get out of town. This is the kind of shit I always think about when people refer to the past as the good old days. But was it? Was it good the good old days? For who? Who had it better than now? Uh, those ordinances had long since gone away by early 1971, when the little town was a place where you didn't think you had to worry about something terrible happening to your child. Also, random trivia, baseball Hall of Famer, one of the greatest pitchers of all time, my favorite pitcher of all time, Nolan Ryan, the Ryan Express, the greatest strikeout artist of fucking ever, grew up in Alvin, graduating high school there, being drafted by the Mets in 1965, this hometown hero, a regular-sized dude with a lightning bolt cannon of an arm had just helped the Miracle Mets win the World Series in 1969. And prior to a local girl's murder in April of 1971, Ryan's athletic achievements were the main gossipy talk of Alvin, Texas. And then that all changed in June. On Thursday, June 17th, 1971, at 12.30 p.m., 13-year-old Colette Anise Wilson stood in Alvin, Texas at the intersection of Highway 6 and County Road 99. The eighth grader wore a Mickey Mouse t-shirt and purple shorts, her hair long and dark. She carried a black clarinet case and a file of sheet music. She was surrounded by undeveloped land, but also only two and a half miles from home. She just left a multi-school band camp. Her instructor had dropped her off where her mom, Claire, said she could pick her up. At the Wilson house, Claire had 10 kids, and she asked which of them wanted to come along to pick up Colette, her second oldest. Wow, 10 kids. Nine of them are 13 and younger. I love my kids to death, but no part of me has ever wished I had more than two kids, let alone 10. Literally have never thought, you know what would be fun? Having another eight mouths to feed. 
You know, it'd be great having another eight hormonal bodies to share my home with. Gosh, you know what I hate? Sleep and time to myself. You know, make me so happy. Almost a dozen little people with not quite developed brains asking me almost nothing but stupid fucking questions from the time I wake up to the time I pass out after beating some kid ass because at least one of them refuses to listen to me every goddamn night. Fuck that. I don't know how people do it. I really don't. But anyway, Claire headed out to grab Colette with her two sons and her daughter, Alice. Just six minutes elapsed between the time Colette exited her instructor's car and when Claire Wilson arrived at the designated pickup corner. And when Claire drove up, Colette was already gone. Someone else was parked there. Someone who pulled off the road in an old car. Claire sat for a few moments looking at that car. There was a man she'd never seen before behind the wheel. A man I'm guessing when she'd finally learned about what happened to her daughter, she'd never stop thinking about. Why didn't I just walk over to his car and talk to him or take down his license plate number, get a physical description, something. But of course, at the time, she couldn't have known what was happening. And as far as I know, this dude had nothing to do with Colette's disappearance. I just know how my brain works and that shit would eat me alive. Doesn't, wouldn't matter how many people told me there was nothing you could do. It would just fucking pop around your head. I just, there's so many victims outside of the people who are actually murdered when it comes to these crimes. After a few minutes, the days before cell phones, Claire returns home so she can make some calls. She calls her husband, Tom, in his dental office. And then Tom calls the police who initially don't seem too worried. Again, it's a sleepy little town. There's been no prior incidents that are happening around here at this time. They figure it's just a rebellious teenager who's going to be home soon enough. Two days later, on June 19th, when Colette still has not shown up or contacted anyone, the authorities begin to treat her disappearance more seriously. They begin to treat it as a kidnapping. They issue a statewide alert. They bring in helicopters, but it's too late. Whoever had taken Colette was long gone. The Texas Rangers and state troopers join the search, but they still can't find her. Claire and Tom even hire a private investigator in the days that follow, but he too fails to uncover any solid evidence. Colette's remains will be found months later, the first dead body attributed to whoever was behind the initial Texas killing fields murders. Just two weeks later, two days before the 4th of July, some men are standing on some scaffolding, painting the Pelican Island Bridge, a steel and cement structure not far from the Galveston Harbor Channel near the southern end of I-45, an industrial zone near the shipping yards, about 25 miles south of that League City killing field. Around 10 that morning, one painter notices something floating in the distance. Before long, they're all staring at it, guessing what it might be. Turns out it was the dead body of a young, light-skinned African-American woman. The girl was nude, her wrists and ankles bound with long plastic laces. Police estimated that the dead girl appeared to be approximately 20 years old. In fact, poor young Brenda Jones was only 14 years old, not even a high schooler. She was about to enter eighth grade that fall. She attended the island's Holy Rosary School, the first African-American Catholic school in the entire state of Texas, where she was considered to be an excellent student. She could have done so many things, but then some selfish, sadistic fuck decided to use her for a, a temporary relief from his sexual urges. I right? decided to end somebody else's life just to fulfill uh, one urge, essentially. When Brenda didn't arrive home on time the previous afternoon, her family quickly had begun to search for her. One of her sisters called the police to report Brenda missing the afternoon before her body was found. Before she went missing, Brenda told her mom that she wanted to go to the University of Texas Medical Branch's John Seeley Hospital to visit an aunt who'd fallen and broken a leg. She made it to the hospital, visited her aunt, then left. Later, a bus driver verified that Brenda got on the bus at the hospital to head home, also got off at the stop that was just a few blocks from home. And in the few block walk between that bus stop and her home, somebody took her. God dang, why do these killers always seem to take the best kids too? Like just once, it would make me just a teeny tiny, you know, feel just a teeny tiny bit better. If you read about one of the victims and it was something like, they found the body of Jenny Anderson today. Jenny had recently gotten expelled from school after she was arrested for sodomizing three kindergartners with an ice pick. Neighbors had also recently solved the mystery of why their pets had gone missing for years when one caught Jenny in the act of killing a local golden retriever by stapling its eyes closed and then using the poor pet as a living lawn dartboard. Jenny was also accused of murdering several neighborhood children before she herself was abducted. Like, it's never in the fucking ballpark of that. It's always some straight-A student going to visit, like, a sick aunt in the hospital, some little angel, some sick fucking devil decides to prey on. And again, not that murdering any kid is okay. It's it just sometimes, it just seems like the very brightest lights seem to get snuffed out the most often. Uh, at the Galveston County Morgue, a medical examiner conducting Brenda's autopsy told police that Brenda had been sexually assaulted, that her panties had been stuffed down her throat before death. The examiner also determined that she died at most a few hours before being found, suggesting that someone had abducted her the afternoon before, then kept her alive all night before killing her around sunrise. My God. 
Initially, no one connected her murder to the earlier disappearance of Colette Wilson. No one connected the murder of Brenda and the disappearance of Colette with, with, uh, with an abduction that had happened back in April, less than two weeks, uh, two weeks before Colette's disappearance either. Uh, back on April 27th, 1971, a 16-year-old girl had went sunbathing on East Beach, about three miles east of the Pelican Island Bridge where Brenda's body washed up. It's a Tuesday afternoon uh, during the school year. Shoreline was deserted. The teenager would tell police that a white man approached her and forced her into his car, then drove her to a more secluded area a short distance away where she was somehow able to escape after he physically beat her and tried to rape her. And too bad in these stories you don't hear more examples of the person escaping and then also killing the attacker. When I used to take uh, Krav Maga classes, classes I really miss, by the way, they, they would teach that the best defense is often a very good offense. And if you do have to strike someone to defend yourself, make sure you incapacitate them before you run. Remove the threat, make sure the threat has been handled, then take off. I'm sure it's way easier, way easier said than done. But if some dude's attacking you and you hit, hit him with like a, like a rock or something, knocks him down, I don't know. Maybe keep hit him with a few more times, the rock. Maybe, maybe smash his fucking head into pulp, you know? Just a nonstop parade of heavy fucking skull, skull wax with a rock. If he didn't want his skull turned into a bloody pancake of brains and, and skull fragments, maybe he shouldn't have tried to abduct and rape somebody or kill somebody. I love it so much in a true crime tale when the victim ends up killing the attacker. Just true instant justice. Uh, I wish so many more stories worked out that way. A month after Brenda was murdered, on August 4th, 1971, two 14-year-olds, Sharon Shaw and Rhonda Renee Johnson, go missing right after they stopped by the Wicks Ski School a water ski-based business in Galveston, the city encompassing the Pelican Island Bridge and East Beach. Galveston, by the way, uh, is on an island, a little, little gulf town. Actually had about 10,000 people, more in the early 70s than it does now. 60,000 compared to 50,000 now. Full of amusement parks, water ski rental companies, jet skis, you know, all kinds of summer fun activities back in 1971. Johnny Wicks and her husband Sam, a marine engineer who'd served in the Navy during World War II, ran Galveston's Wicks Ski School and Sam told police that Shaw and Johnson had stayed only briefly at his shop, leaving when he told him that the ski boat wasn't going out because of choppy waters. The Wicks's neighbors later said that they saw the girls leave the ski school, walk east towards 61st Street, a main thoroughfare that led towards the beach. Shaw and Johnson lived in Webster, a small town half an hour north of Galveston on the mainland just off I-45. Webster less than three miles north of the site of the League City killing field. When the girls didn't return home, their parents began searching. Almost three months later, on October 28th, 1971, a 19-year-old bookkeeper working at a Houston Kroger grocery store, Gloria Ann Gonzalez, also reported missing by her roommate. Gonzalez had last been seen at their apartment on Jacklin Street in Houston, about 20 miles north of the League City epicenter. Like Colette Wilson and Shaw and Johnson, Gonzalez just disappeared. Then on November 9th, 1971, 12-year-old Allison Craven also disappears. Her mother returns home from running errands for an hour to find her daughter not in the apartment. Six girls are now dead or missing. All disappeared between June and November 1971 from the area between Houston and Galveston, all between only 12 and 19 years old. Just six days after Allison Craven's disappearance on November 15th, two more girls go missing. 15-year-old friends and Galveston residents Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson. Debbie was the daughter of German immigrants, had been born and raised in the area. Maria's family had moved to the area the previous year. Her stepdad had moved the family to the island that Galveston sits upon after getting a job there as a gynecologist. Debbie and Maria both loved the beach and the Gulf, and they frequented, frequented the two search surf shops on the island and also were regular customers of the Wicks Ski School. At approximately 11, 15 a.m., they went missing. Two teenage girls working at the Baskin Robbins ice cream parlor at Galveston's Port Holiday Mall saw Debbie and Maria on the street, called them over shortly before 11.15. When they parted, one of the girls in the shop looked out, saw Debbie and Maria hitchhiking back when it wasn't crazy to do that, when people trust each other more. Moments later, a white man in a white van with a peace sticker on the back window pulled over, lowered his window, talked to Maria. Both girls scrambled into his van, and then they were never seen alive again. When the girls didn't return home that afternoon, their parents called each other, and the police, Maria's uh, father, also notified the Texas Rangers, and the Ackermans called their sons home from college to help search for their sister. And by the way, the Texas Rangers, the subject of Suck 47 from two years ago, are a law enforcement agency, not to be confused with the professional baseball team of the exact same name uh, based in Arlington, Texas. I, I doubt anyone is confused, but it is, it is, I mean, it's the exact same name. The Rangers are the team uh, by Nolan Ryan would play for in the final seasons of his career. And again, doubt anyone was confused, but how confusing would it be if for some reason you just, you thought that people were calling professional baseball players? 
to look for kids when they went missing. Like it made me just picture like guys like uh, Rafael Palmero, Julio Franco, Nolan Ryan, Pudge Rodriguez, Gaylord Perry hitting the streets, just questioning people, looking for clues in full uniform. Like, like even Pudge has his, has his catcher mask on. When they, when they uncover an important clue, they just throw a quick around the horn, toss the baseball around. When a suspect runs away, Nolan beans him in the back with a 102 mile per hour heat fastball. Umpire pops out of fucking no strike three. You're out of here. The search party doesn't even get started until an umpire has to yell, let's play ball. Then after seven hours of searching, they stop for a mandatory song break. Take me out to the crime scene. Take me out to the fields. Find me some clues like some creeper tracks. I just want to get this kid back so it's root, root, root for the Rangers. If we don't win, it's a shame. Let me put one, maybe two shots in a bad guy's brain. Play ball! I know, I know that's fucking ridiculous. That, that's the shit I spend way too much time on preparing these episodes. <laughs> I think I've taken that absurdity far enough now. I just had that image in my brain and I feel better getting it out and putting it in your brains. On Wednesday, November 17th, two days after Debbie and Maria's disappearances, both of their families receive, sadly, some terrible news. While fishing, an elderly man happens upon a body in Turner Bayou near Texas City. A short drive north on I-45 from Galveston, Texas City is less than 20 miles from League City. The corpse was partially submerged near a small wooden bridge that extended across the narrow bayou. Ropes were used to reel it in. The dead girl had long, dark, reddish-brown hair. She wore only a pink bra under a, a maroon blouse pierced earrings and rings from the waist down. She was totally nude. 15-year-old Maria Johnson. Her mom and stepdad had to identify her body. While helping pull Maria's body from the water, a Texas City fireman spotted skin protruding from the water 150 feet downstream from where Maria Johnson's body had been found. It was another 15-year-old girl's corpse, also nude from the waist down. It was Debbie Ackerman. Both Maria and Debbie's wrists and ankles were bound, just like Brenda Jones' wrists and ankles had been bound this time with long black cords that looked like shoestrings. On Debbie's body, officers noticed gunshot wounds to the upper back and the right of the spine. When word circulated that the last time Debbie and Maria were seen alive, they had been hitchhiking. Local hitchhiking came to a grinding halt. The police still hadn't connected all of the disappearances and murders, but fear had already come to the Gulf Freeway and changed the way the locals were living their lives. Parents gave their kids new curfews or started refusing to let them be out without adult supervision at all. Just six days after Maria and Debbie's bodies were found, November 23rd, 1971, a man wielding a metal detector walked through a heavily wooded area near the Attics Reservoir, west of Houston, about 50 miles from the League City Killing Field. Rather than finding buried treasure, the man found a decapitated, decomposing body. It was the remains of that 19-year-old Kroger clerk who had been missing for nearly a month now, Gloria Gonzalez. Also in the autopsy, doctor examined Gloria's teeth for a positive identification. It was determined that some of the teeth found at the crime scene belonged to a second victim. Three days later, deputies returned to the attic's reservoir where Gonzalez's body had been found, this time with cadaver dogs and equipment to mount a wider inspection of the area. At 1030 that morning, after fighting off nasty ass Texas bugs wading through knee high grass, watching out for venomous, not poisonous snakes. A sheriff spotted a pile of bones on a bed of decaying leaves 50 yards from the flags that marked the spot where searchers had recovered Gonzalez's body. It was the remains of Colette Wilson, the 13-year-old who disappeared from Alvin, Texas back on June 17th. Five dead girls in five months. The police are now painfully aware that the murders, or at least most of them, are very likely the work of the same killer. Six weeks After the remains of Gloria Gonzalez and Colette Wilson are discovered on January 3rd, 1972, the remains of two more girls are found near the affluent waterfront community of Shore Acres. The bodies are again found near some water, this time on the banks of an overflow ditch running off of Taylor Bayou, east of I-45, 30 miles north of Galveston, 12 miles east of the League City killing field. It's the bodies of Sharon Shaw and Rhonda Renee Johnson, the two 14-year-olds who five months earlier vanished after leaving the Wick Ski School when they were told that the water was too choppy to take them out. The dead girl's parents went before the press, pleading with anyone with information to come forward, hoping to find the man or men who'd murdered their daughters. And if you're thinking, you know, hey, why say man or men? They didn't know for sure the killer or killers were male. Well, if you think that, you must not have listened to very much true crime. These crimes are committed at the hands of men roughly 999 out of 1,000 times. 
The parents are also are also called out local law enforcement, demanding that more effort be put towards finding who was killing all these girls, at least seven dead girls in only six months now. Or, you know, uh, the small police agencies along the Gulf Coast wanted nothing more than to solve these cases. They just didn't know how. They had never experienced anything remotely like this. The behavioral science unit at the FBI was, was just being formed in 1972. Profilers were just beginning to study cases like this. Local police did frantically search for suspects. They did put together lists. Uh, a list that would sadly uncover some very crooked cops and a list that would send the wrong man to prison for the rest of his life. Another victim that wasn't, you know, wasn't killed at the hands of any of these killers, but definitely had his life ruined because of these crimes. Two months later in March, 1972, a local sheriff announces that he has a theory about who'd murdered all the girls. He thinks that the man was a former mental patient, one who tried to abduct a woman after stalking her recently. Unfortunately, a closer look revealed that this man uh, was just criminally focused on, on the one woman he'd been romantically, inter romantically interested in, not lots of women. And there was literally no evidence connecting him to any of the other cases, and he also had solid al alibis. This particular theory doesn't sound real thought out. Just one excited officer. Just, I, I know who did it! It was a crazy guy! Ah, what makes you say that, Chuck? <laughs> Guys, he's crazy! Think about it! Who does shit like this? Fucking crazy people. Okay, Chuck, uh, do you have anything else at all to base your suspicion on? I mean, not right now, but it's a start of something. Uh, yeah, that was a, a terrible suspect. Another possibility was, and I love how this is written in some of the old articles, a quote, young hippie with a Volkswagen bus and California license plates. Fucking dirty hippie. Uh, it was pulled over in a traffic stop. He raised suspicion by asking the officers about the girl's deaths. Also, uh, he was uh, seen as being suspicious, probably because he had long hair and was a fan of wacky tobacco. Uh, police searched the man's vehicle, discovered a rifle. They briefly thought they may have found their man. No, he'd only recently arrived. He'd heard the news about the murders on TV, had driven all the way to Texas, thinking that he could crack the case and he'd get the reward money like some sort of hippie Sherlock Holmes. Just, hey, hey, man, it's, it's elementary, man. Like, like listen, Watson, dude, we need, we need clues, man. Clues are so important, man. Hey, you like Cat Stevens? Dude, he's, oh, shit, man, he's so good. We should have Cat Stevens help us, man. Cat Stevens is like on another spiritual level. Uh, suspects three and four were 24-year-old Houston record driver, Harry Lanham, and his friend, 22-year-old Vietnam vet, Anthony Napa Jr. They were arrested in April 1972 for the murder of 22-year-old Linda Faye Sutherland in Pearland, a suburb just south of Houston. Her body had been uh, found the previous November, around the time of the Ackerman and Johnson killings, lying in some weeds under an area bridge. Linda Faye's killing didn't bear a lot of resemblance to the other murders beyond that the 21-year-old barmaid's body was found in a ditch. Unlike the other, Sutherland was fully dressed, still wearing brown go-go boots and a short pink dress, even her sweater. So police couldn't make a case for the other homicides against Lanham and Napa, both of whom are now thankfully dead. It is, there wasn't any evidence to connect him to these other crimes. Uh, Lanham died when he lunged for an officer's gun in the Harris County Jail shortly after his arrest, and he was shot and killed. Instant justice! Napa was released from prison in 1989 at the age of 41 after serving 15 years of a 50-year sentence, and then he died a free man in 2014 at the age of 66. The fifth suspect, uh, the super unlucky, Michael Lloyd Self, 24 years old in 1972. Uh, Michael's is a very tragic tale. On June 10th, 1972, Self was arrested on charges connected to the murders of the two Webster girls, Sharon Shaw and Rhonda Renee Johnson. When Renee Johnson and Sharon Shaw's bodies were found, Michael Lloyd Self was working at a gas station in Webster. He was obsessed with their murders, talked to customers and coworkers about them all the time. He was also considered basically just to be a, an odd duck, or as my mom would say, a, a, a character. Uh, by many locals. Adopted as a young child, poor Self had lost his father when he was only 10. His mom, a second grade school teacher, became a single parent, became unusually focused on him, and he became a, a shy mama's boy. He didn't ever do very well in school, and actually a doctor who examined him in the fourth grade diagnosed him as suffering from minimal brain injury. So basically, this poor guy is somewhat mentally handicapped. Michael Self loved police officers, making friends with the police chief, frequenting the local police station, Excuse me. Uh, so he liked to gossip about local crime in general, was doing this long before the disappearances. And in Webster, there just wasn't that many interesting cases to talk about until the double homicide. 
And then Self really wanted to talk about that, talked about it all the time. And people started to get suspicious. And then the the local shady officers, and you're going to find out how shady they are here soon, turned him into an easy target just to kind of, you know, get easy credit for wrapping up a a double murder investigation. Self, according to later depositions by other officers who ventured in and out of his interrogation room when he was brought in as a suspect, say that he was literally beat into a murder confession by the local police chief, Michael Morris, who tied Self to a chair, told him that he wouldn't untie him until he confessed, kept him tied to the chair for hours beat him in the stomach and across the back with a billy club, supposedly even pulled out a a six-shot revolver, put it against his head, pretended to have a bullet in the chamber, and would pull the trigger, playing Russian roulette with him. Just spin the chamber, put put the gun against his head, pull the trigger. One officer would later report that he saw Mike Self looking to Morris to tell him what he uh, needed to write in his confession. This officer, who initially heard Self adamantly claim his innocence, described Self as being utterly terrified of Morris. By the time Self's defense lawyer, Dewey Meadows, met with him, Mike had already signed a confession, describing in detail how he murdered the two girls. Yet when Meadows talked to Self, he insisted that he wasn't guilty, that he'd never even met the girls. The confession was nonsense. Self wrote that he threw the girls' bodies into not Taylor Bayou or the ditch where they were found, but into nearby Taylor Lake, which didn't make sense. He wrote that he picked up one girl at her house, which wasn't even possible. Since when he did this, it uh, supposedly occurred hours after her parents were already home and looking for her, after they'd reported her missing. Self wrote that he beat the girls on the head with a Coke bottle, knocking them out, which also made no sense because neither Shaw's nor Johnson's skulls were fractured in any way, which seemed highly unlikely if he had hit them hard enough to knock them unconscious. To fix these inconsistencies before the trial began, Webster police had Self sign a second confession, where now his account magically really resembled the case facts. Dewey Meadows, his lawyer, was exasperated. He had never even been notified by the police that his client was being interrogated, was being asked to sign another confession. He had no idea that Self had signed the second confession until it was already done. Poor Dewey as well. What what a fucking terrible name, by the way, for an attorney. Change your name if you're Dewey Dewey Meadows. That inspires no... There was no way. I know it's ridiculous. No fucking way I would have an attorney called Dewey Meadows. Especially he represented you at a murder trial? Fuck that. You know, Ben Matlock. That's a solid-ass attorney name. Perry Mason. Alpha name. Christine Sullivan. Hard consonants. I like it. Dewey Meadows. Blah. Soft. Weak. Why don't you hire Scooter Pillow Puncher? Fucking Skippy Doolittle. Maybe little, little Stevie Tinkerbell. I have Jack here, Honor. Shut the fuck up, Stevie! No one cares what you think, Tinkerbell! At their meetings, Meadows noticed uh, how Mike Self appeared unable to defend himself, instead looking to his mom for guidance. He seemed weak, not guilty, told his attorney he signed the confessions because the police had told him he wouldn't get to see his mom until he did. And he was scared of Officer Morris. Uh, By the way, Mike Self reminds me a lot of Brendan Dassey for any Netflix making a murderer fans out there. If you've watched videos of that poor kid, obviously not mentally in tip top shape being manipulated by, by officers. Because of the coerced confession, a jury sends Self to prison for life. Then a few years later, in September 1975, some guys get caught robbing the State National Bank in the little town of Cattle Mills, northeast of Dallas. And who are these bank robbers? Well, two of them were some of the uh, Webster police officers that worked on Self's case. The leader, the leader of the gang, a gang that had been robbing banks in the area since around the time of Self's arrest, was none other than the former Webster police chief, Donald Ray Morris, that piece of shit. Mr. Russian Roulette, a crooked cop who'd bullied a mentally handicapped man into an obviously coerced confession that sent him to prison for life. How was he not retried fucking immediately? Despite Morris's arrest, Self's appeal didn't come up for review until 1979. When Morris was serving time in federal prison, articles appeared in Texas newspapers about the bizarre case of a man whose confession may have been forced by police officers who turned out to be bank robbers. When Mike Self explained to a Houston Chronicle reporter in 1989 that he'd signed the confessions or why he'd signed the confessions. He said then to keep Chief Morris from blowing my brains out. Morris said that if I didn't sign the confession, he'd shoot me and say I tried to escape. Self said he didn't blame the jurors who'd rule on his fate, insisting that they were just doing their job based on what they heard. Despite all of this, Self's appeal is inexplicably rejected. Apparently, there were just more than, uh, you know, two crooked cops in local law enforcement in the area at that time. I feel like there's some weird cover-up happening here. Then another 13 years later, 1992, after Self has now been in prison for almost 20 years for some bullshit, the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals rules that the federal district court could not overturn the state court's ruling despite evidence 
of a coerced confession. What the fuck? The Fifth Circuit noted that Mike Self had his opportunity to make his case, that the confessions had been coerced at the trial, and that the decision the state court made, uh, you know, still should hold up against him. Well, that decision ended Mike Self's appeals process, and then he died of a heart attack in prison in 2000 after serving damn near 30 years for heinous crimes he never committed. Such a tragedy, such a bunch of bullshit. The bank robbing conviction clearly points to the crooked character of the, of the men who got a confession out of Self. The jury didn't know that the dude who, you know, was the main guy behind getting this confession was out robbing banks at the same time. Like, it's fuck. It's, again, echoes of making a murder. For those who have seen that. Bojangles, our three-legged, one-eyed pit bull mascot, is fucking furious right now. We already know he hates communists. He also has a lot of love for cops, good cops, which means he really hates bad cops who give law enforcement officers a bad name. He just drew a picture of what he thinks Morris's face looks like on the sun- sucked dungeon floor, and he just took a shit on it. And they pissed on it, which is unfortunate because I know he won't clean it up. Because if I even think about telling him to clean it up, he will slap me out of this goddamn chair. Okay, now that we know that it was highly unlikely that Michael Self killed those girls, like basically not, it didn't happen. Let's go back to 1973, the year after his arrest and the year the Texas Killing Fields murders continue right after a quick word from one of our sponsors. Time Suck is brought to you today by Quip. It's time for spring cleaning, meat sacks. Do you like having teeth? Yeah, then you should pay attention. Do you like having teeth that don't look like a kid tried to carve replica human teeth? out of some Cool Ranch Dorito crumbs. Yeah? All right, then check this shit out. Quip's got an easy way to start polishing those chompers up for summer. As one of the first electric toothbrushes accepted by the American Dental Association, Quip can help pave the way to a healthier mouth and mind in just two minutes, twice a day. Not to mention, the brush head's delivered on a dentist-recommended schedule of every three months for just five bucks. Quip provides a friendly reminder to stay committed to your oral health. And now the whole family can get refreshed with Quip thanks to the new Kids Quip, which has the same two-minute timer, and guiding pulses as their original version. There are no childish gimmicks, just kid-friendly features like a small brush, watermelon anti-cavity toothpaste, rubber grip handles and colors your little ones will love. Get those toddler chiclets shined up all nice and purty. I just got my uh, first three-month refill, and I love the taste of my Quip toothpaste and love that they throw in a little battery to keep me vibrating away, putting some solid, clean frequencies on my meat grinders. I love little touches like not going cheap and making me get my own battery. I love having fresh new brush heads delivered right to my door, and I love the way Quip feels on the gums around my teeth. You're not supposed to sandpaper them away. I didn't learn that until I was about 39. I love Quip, and so do over 1 million other happy, healthy mouths. Quip starts just $25, and if you go to getquip.com slash timesuck right now, you can get your first refill pack for free. That's your first refill pack for free at getquip, G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash timesuck. Link in the episode description, button on the Timesuck website and app. And they're tracking who listened to the show. And anybody who doesn't do that, they're going to come and they're going to beat your fucking head in with a baseball bat. They're running a new special. It's called Get Our Goddamn Toothbrush or We'll Beat Your Fucking Head In With a Baseball Bat. It's the most aggressive campaign I've ever seen for oral hygiene. Now let's go back to 1973. Joe, please don't put that in the sponsor read. (laughs) Let's go back to 1973, the year after Michael Self's bullshit arrest and the year the Texas Killing Fields murders continued. January 3rd, 1973, Kimberly Ray uh, Pitchford Strawberry blonde, 16-year-old with hazel eyes, arrives early at J. Frank Doobie High School. Probably Doobie High School, probably not Doobie. In Houston's far southeast reaches for her first day back after the winter break. She was a sophomore who enjoyed roller skating at a rink near her house. She was self-conscious about the new braces. Coworkers at a fast food restaurant where she worked part-time noticed she covered her mouth to hide them when she smiled. Normal kid. And on January 3rd, she was wearing a new black coat she just received as a Christmas gift when she walked out of a driver's ed class and then was never seen alive again. The next afternoon, two teenage boys found her body when they walked by a wooden bridge on County Road 65, a rural lane 22 miles from the driving school, noticed something black billowing against a fence. It was Kimberly's new coat. When they walked up to get a closer look at the coat, they saw a girl's body face down partially underwater. They ran to a nearby home, called the police, who immediately found Kimberly Pitchford's driver's license application in a coat pocket. Another victim of the Texas Killing Fields, and two more would follow very soon. Over a year later, on September 6, 1974, law enforcement in the Killing Fields area were again searching for two missing girls. 12-year-olds Brooks Bracewell and 14, or excuse me, 12-year-old, excuse me, uh, Brooks Bracewell and 14-year-old Georgia Gear had went missing that afternoon from Dickinson, a little town of around 10,000 at the time, just four miles south down I-45 from League City. 
The two girls didn't show up at McAdams Junior High School, and the police initially assumed that this time they might just be dealing with some runaways, especially after reports came in that the girls were seen in a motel on the county road near Alvin playing football with a group of unidentified men. Afterward, another witness claims to have noticed the girls hitchhiking, and yet others said the girls had stopped at a convenience store. And then no one knew for sure what happened to them until April 18th, 1976. On that day, a roughneck working at a nearby Phillips oil site stumbled upon the girls' skulls. Sadly, the skulls wouldn't be identified as belonging to Georgia Gear and Brooks Bracewell until five years later in April of 1981. By 1976, thanks mostly to the initial arrest of Ted Bundy in 1975, the term serial killer was now part of the public lexicon. And now... A serial killer was thought to be responsible for the majority of these murders. Someone other than Mike Self, who was behind bars when these new murders were occurring because he was innocent. No more girls disappeared in that area for a little over a year. Then on May 21st, 1977, four days after my birth, 12-year-old Suzanne Susie Bowers left her grandparents' home two and a half blocks from the Galveston Seawall. Her plan was to walk a mile home, change into a bathing suit, grab her bike, then ride three miles east on Sewell Boulevard to meet friends at a popular hangout, Stewart Beach. She'd asked her grandfather for a ride home, but he later said that he thought the exercise would be good for his granddaughter and sent her on her way. That poor bastard. Totally okay thing to do, but the guilt he must have felt when she disappeared, and well, as I'm going to reveal in a second, he felt a ton of guilt. Something like that can tear a family apart. The anger Susie's parents might have felt towards him, again, not his fault. The anger his wife might have felt towards him, even though it wasn't his fault. But it would have been hard not to just keep saying to yourself, if I would have just driven her home that day. Susie started walking home, a route she'd walked 100 times before, but she never, never made it this time. She disappeared for almost two years. In March 1979, two boys on dirt bikes rode through a field not far from where Colette Wilson, the dentist's daughter, had disappeared, and they found Susie's skeleton. And years later, when Susie's grandfather died, his wife told an investigator into these murders that his final words were his dead granddaughter's name. How fucking sad is that? All because one selfish piece of shit decided he needed to come in a very specific way. It's insane. Our world is so insane sometimes. So many, you know, uh, so much, just easily avoidable pain. So much more to life than selfishly satisfying your darkest sexual urge, right? The world would be so much better if when dudes were about to do something horrific, and it is usually dudes, and sexually motivated, they just jerked off first. Maybe just jerk off, get a massage, have a nap. How many rapes and murders would be avoided if right before acting on a horrible impulse, some dude just snuck off and just jerked it? I know something that simple doesn't fix everything, but I think it would help a little at least. What if most important decisions just in general weren't made until right after you jerked off? Or for our vagina leaning listeners, you know, rubbed one out. Uh, Mr. Buffett, would you like to acquire the company or not? We need an answer, uh, Mr. Buffett. I'll give you an answer in 10 minutes. Uh, first, I need to use the bathroom. I need to clear my head, <laughs> so, to, so to speak. So I can warn Buffett, just sneaking up. <laughs> Comes back. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to, to steer this ship in the right direction now. Some of you might find an article about uh, serial killer Henry Lee Lucas, about how he claimed to kill Suzanne Bowers. Uh, it does not appear to be true. Uh, Henry, Lu Lu Henry Lee Lucas, excuse me, would later confess that he'd only claimed he'd murdered uh, Bowers and other girls to get favors from authorities, perks like access to television and cigarettes, he kind of sent a lot of people on a lot of wild goose chases. Okay, now that we've reached the end of the 70s, we're going to put a pin in the timeline, take a look at the best suspect for these initial murders. A suspect that didn't emerge until many, many years later when kick-ass detective Fred Page began going through some old Killing Fields cold cases. And this suspect is super creep Ed Bell. And we're, and, and we're, and we're going to look into Bell uh, you know, a little thoroughly. We're, we're going to jump out of the timeline then we'll jump back into it, uh, picking it up in the 1980s. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. This, uh, this Ed Bell is going to lead us to Matthew McConaughey. It's all just an interesting, weird suspect. Uh, when Detective Page started poking around the cold case files at Galveston PD in 2006, he asked a senior officer, Carla Costello, who had worked on the initial investigation. Uh, if she had any old suspects, she really thought might have done it. And she brought up Ed Bell. She said he'd, he'd written two letters confessing to the killings years later when he'd already been incarcerated for another murder. But then when investigators followed up with him, he refused to talk to them, uh, at least about, you know, his confessions. So was this guy just having some sadistic fun fucking with the police or did he actually do it? I think he probably did it. Let's check out his story. For starters, in his initial confession letters, Bell said he'd shot those two 15-year-old Galveston friends uh, and Wicks ski school frequenters 
Ackerman and Johnson with a 357 Magnum pistol, Debbie in the neck or the head, and Maria in the neck or the back. And at the time, he said he stood above the teenagers on a small bridge while he did so. This did, in fact, match up with how they died, and the press didn't have those specific details. Uh, here's a little background on Bell. He was born in Houston between 1938 and 1940. Different articles reveal different years. Uh, he just died of a heart attack on April 20th this year. So just recently died. Uh, different Texas newspapers gave different ages for him. But they put him between 79 and 82 when he died. Ed's father, Carl Clayton Bell, was an East Texas oil field worker, and his mother was a housewife. Growing up, a cousin uh, killed his own father after supposedly getting tired of watching him torture his wife. So growing up, Ed did see some violence in the family. He went to Texas A&M, where he majored in physical education and minored in biology, learned to scuba dive in college. One summer, he worked as an aquatic director at a boys' camp. He got married to a woman named Bonnie, and they had three children together. He also started showing his dick to young girls in public at least as early as 1966, the first time he was arrested for this. He exposed himself that time to some young girls in the rural ranching community of Sedan, Texas, just west of Plainview. Sedan, uh, it's about 600 miles from League City. Little, so long ways away. Little town also built along the Santa Fe Railroad, about 20 miles from the New Mexico border. 140 mile per hour, uh, 140 mile drive, excuse me, from America's butthole, Roswell, New Mexico. O old time stuff reference there. Bell was ordered into treatment for his first offense, stayed at the Big Spring State Hospital, a 200 bed psychiatric facility located about 40 miles east of Midland, Texas. I have to imagine this may have caused some trouble in his marriage. I was thinking about that when these weird arrests, you know, early on in people's timelines. I mean, Lindsay gets annoyed with me for, 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 for uh, forgetting uh, a lot of stuff, like forgetting to, to buy something I said I was going to buy, uh, forgetting I'm supposed to do something with the kids, you know, that day, or forgetting to wipe dirt off the dog's paws before letting them in the house right after the floors have been cleaned. I'm guessing she would be more than a little annoyed with me if the police <laughs> brought me home after I'd whipped my dick out in front of some kids and started jerking off. Like, how do, how do you get through that? How do people stay married after something like that? Baby, 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 I know you're upset. I know you're upset. Just, listen, it's a big misunderstanding. You have to believe me. Listen, did I get caught jerking off in the middle of the street? Yeah, yeah, I did. I do it all the time, actually. But here's the thing. I didn't know those kids were there. I was so into the jerking. I did not notice the kids were a few feet away. I was, I was thinking about you. And I got so horny, I couldn't wait till I got home. I had to pull over, hop out, and just fucking pump my dick in the street. I didn't, I didn't realize that my balls were bouncing off a nine-year-old's head when I was doing it. I was just so in, I was in the fucking zone. You have to understand. <laughs> when he got caught, Dirtbag Bell and his family lived in Lubbock, where Bell had a job as a phar pharmaceutical rep uh, working with phys physicians, guessing his employer was a little upset, guessing he maybe lost his job. He was also working on a master's degree at Texas Tech, and then in Lubbock in April of 1969, arrested again for exposing himself to young girls. Dude cannot keep his dick away from kids. Now, Lubbock also a long way from the killing fields, like over 500 miles away, but this second uh, time did bring him into the area. Because in April of 1969, he, he went to Galveston. He went there to undergo some recommended inpatient counseling at the University of Texas Medical Branch's psychiatric program. He was put on Valium, diagnosed as having a personality disorder and depression. He probably was depressed because they weren't, you know, saying it was okay to fucking wag, wag his dick around in front of kids. And his treatment went well enough for him to be discharged in July of 1970. Sociopaths, so good at convincing psychiatrists are cured. He was not cured. After completing treatment in Galveston, Bell met Doug Pruns, who ran Doug's dive and surf shop. Bell somehow pulled together a stash of scuba equipment he wanted to rent through the shop, and he and Doug struck up a partnership. And Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson, along with many other of the early victims, used to frequent this particular surf shop. There was a whole little community of beach kids who went to this surf shop in addition to the Wicks Ski School and a couple of their spots. So Bell would have been familiar at the very least with a lot of these girls. Girls he was obviously sexually attracted to or he wouldn't have been fucking jerking it in the street in front of these kids. Um, you know, girls he was for sure probably getting tired of getting arrested uh, for flashing and masturbating in front of them. Also, a witness statement from the time of Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson's disappearance placed them at the Baskin Robbins ice cream shop in Galveston. We talked about that. Remember the last time they were seen? They were seen getting into a white van. Well, in February of 1972, Bell was again picked up for exposing himself to yet another young girl. He'd fallen back off the please, please just keep your nasty dick in your pants wagon. This time he did it in Louisiana and the arresting officer recorded the type of vehicle Bell was driving that day in 1970 white, 1971 white Ford van. Sadly, even though this was the third time 
He'd been caught showing kids his dick. He was just given a slap on the wrist. Can we please move towards way less prison time for drug possession with no intent to distribute? Right, those kind of charges, way more prison time for sexual crimes. Making Bell look even more guilty was one of Debbie Ackerman's good friends telling Detective Page when he investigated years later that the group of friends they ran with that summer spent time at the same waterfront house where Bell also lived. He's not with his family anymore. Of course not. His wife hasn't stuck around for all this fucking dig wagon. They, they knew the man who owned the property and some took diving lessons from him. So Bell clearly knew these girls. He was around these girls at his work and at his house. I think it's safe to say based on his MO, he desired them. Now for even more evidence of Bell's guilt. Two weeks after Colette Wilson's abduction in June 71, Colette being that first murder victim, you know, that, that has been lumped in with the Texas kill, uh, Fields killing murders. Another local teenager was sunbathing in her backyard, resting with her eyes closed. She suddenly heard somebody watching her, looked up, saw a stranger jerking off above her. The man that girl would later identify, you know, years later, dead ringer for Ed Bell when she was finally shown the picture of Ed Bell. Yep, for sure him. Of course, he's a creep. These type of sexual deviants tend to escalate their deviant behavior based on everything I've ever read about these type of dirtbags. And I've read a lot about them by now. He clearly wanted to do more than just jerk off around kids. Then, the following year, on August 24th, Bell pulled up in front of a house in Pasadena, Texas, southeast of Houston. On the street, Bell saw a group of children playing, and this fucking weirdo got out of a red and white GMC pickup, nude from the waist down, and began masturbating. Showbiz! That is how they do it in Hollywood! Which is an Albert Fish reference for any confused new listener. This dude's fucking out of control. The girls scream. Then a 26-year-old Vietnam vet, recently home from the service, Larry Dickens, Here's his mother, Dorothy, calling the police. The former Marine shouts at Bell, runs to Bell's truck, grabs the keys out of his ignition so the son of a bitch can't drive away. Furious, Bull, uh, Bell pulls out a 22 pistol out from inside his pickup, shoots Dickens four times in the chest. Somehow Dickens manages to not die, runs towards his garage. Inside the house, Dickens' mother calls the police, pleading for help. Her son staggers down the driveway before collapsing. Bell then grabs a high-powered rifle from his pickup, walks over to Dickens, who's pleading for his life. He could take his keys back if he wanted now. Nope. Bell straddles the ex-Marine, I guess furious that he interrupted his sex crime, pulls the trigger and kills him. 20 minutes later, after a car chase and a gun battle, police have Bell secured in the back of a squad car. They drive him to the Dickens house, where he is positively identified as the man who murdered Larry. Then, somehow, after he's taken to jail, his lawyer is able to post-bond he, he liquidates his bank accounts and then he's on the land with $140,000 in his pocket. And then this son of a bitch avoided capture for 14 fucking years. And then Matthew McConaughey caught him. Not even totally joking, actually. For his first ever acting role, Matthew McConaughey played that ex-Marine, Larry Dickens, that brave young man who Ed Bell shot on the 12th episode of the fifth season of Dennis Farina's Unsolved Mysteries that aired on December 2. 1992. How random is that? I would play the audio, but sadly, it was not a speaking role. So great if it would have been. Let's just imagine what that might have sounded like. All right, all right, all right. I see what you love about these girls, man. You get older. They stay the same age. But they're too young, Ed. And your penis is too far to your pants. Time is a flat circle, Ed. Everything we've done or will do. We're going to do over and over again. And for you, that's jerking off in front of some kids on the street, Ed. That's showbiz, Ed. That is how they do it in Hollywood. But I got to stop you, Ed. I got to stop the circle. Because this ain't all right, all right, all right. Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for popping in here and doing that. Appreciate it. Thank you for the applause. You, you bet. Uh-huh. Sadly, no moment like that for the young McConaughey in Unsolved Mysteries. But he does have his shirt almost completely unbuttoned for you fans out there. Lucifina, big, big fan of how his abs looked in this role. Hey, Lucifina! Uh, while McConaughey's episode aired, Unsolved Mysteries set a record for the wettest viewer vaginas in the history of the show. That's not official, but I do believe it to be true. More importantly, after McConaughey's episode airs, viewer phone calls lead authorities down to Panama where Bell is living under an alias, the name of a dead cousin he'd married again, had begun a totally new life, running tourist boats, prospecting for gold on land he'd bought outside of Panama City. God knows what this son of a bitch was doing to kids down in Panama where thanks to more extreme poverty and less government stability in the 80s, 
Probably much easier to get away with jerking off in the street or doing God knows what to Panamanian children. Finally, on June 1993, Bell tried for Dickens' murder, found guilty, given a 70-year sentence. Five years later, he wrote his Killing Fields confession letters, claiming to have murdered 11 Texas teenagers. He called them the 11 in heaven. Five in 1971, six more in the mid to late 70s. But because he wouldn't cooperate with authorities other than this initial confession, because he was already in prison, essentially for life, he wasn't put on trial. Also, his confession was full of some inconsistencies. And then after his initial confession, he said so much weird, crazy shit that he lost all credibility. For the 1971 murders, Bell left out Brenda Jones, but included the other murders that made headlines that year. The dentist daughter, Colette Wilson, the two Galveston girls whose bodies were found in Turner Bayou, Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson, Sharon uh, uh, Shaw, Rhonda Renee Johnson from Webster, who poor Mike Self was convicted of murdering. And here's where the really crazy shit uh, part comes in. Bell also said that he shouldn't be punished for the killings because it was all part of what he called, quote unquote, the program. Bell said he was a target slash victim of a government-sponsored experiment that led to these girls' deaths. I'm not making this up. While he wouldn't discuss the killings after his initial letters, he would talk at length about the program to anyone who was willing to put up with his batshit crazy talk. Bell said stuff like the purpose of the program was to take a good kid, i.e. him, and then subject him to abuse and manipulation for many years, toy with his physiology, determine if he could be made bad. The first step in Bell's definition of turning to the dark side included becoming gay. The final step centered on believing in a higher power. This is one of his quotes. They wanted me to become homosexual, then homicidal. What comes after homicidal? Suicidal, then crazy, nuts, paranoid schizophrenia. And finally, they wanted to turn me into a Jesus freak. Then they think I'll tell them what they want to know. And then a reporter asked, tell them what? And he said, why people do bad things. (laughs) If Bell's reasoning made any sense to any of you, please seek uh, psychological help immediately. This dude tried to claim that the government first made him into a homosexual, then made him homicidal, then suicidal, then mentally ill, then religious, all so he could tell them why people do bad things. Uh, Too bad the program didn't start with suicidal when it came to Bell. Uh, Looking back, Bell also said he knew from early on that his sex drive was exceptional. That's why he was chosen for the program. As a teenager, he masturbated five or six times a day. Damn government testing off his jerking limits. At 15, he claimed his father, an oil field worker, hired a hitman to kill him because he was having sex with animals on the family's Texas ranch. Totally makes sense. Having sex with cows and horses, other barnyard creatures until your dad hires someone to kill you. Classic step seven of the program. That's right after step six. Turn your dick into a dick-shaped callus from near nonstop masturbation. It's right before step eight. Bend space and time with your subconscious mind. Time is a flat circle, Ed. And time is also part of the program. All right, all right, all right. And why did he confess to the 11 killings? So he could get out of jail. That's, he thought he would be released. Seriously. Bell said he, he, he was his way. He told about the killings to expose the people behind the program. He thought once his fate was known, he would have to be released from prison. He said, I wrote the letters because I figured out the program. When I figured out what had been done to me, the pressure came off of me. I realized this was done to me on purpose. So I would do bad things. It wasn't my fault. What the fuck? It is amazing the lies so many of us tell ourselves to feel better about our shitty, shitty choices. I hate it when assholes do this. I mean, maybe he was mentally ill, but, you know, he's running all the successful businesses right before this happened. I doubt it. I I just think he built up an elaborate fantasy in his head that allowed him to do the worst things imaginable and still not consider himself to be a terrible person. Actually consider himself to be a good person, an innocent victim even. Oh, there's, why do people do that? Own your shit. I've done terrible things. We all have. Why lie about it? There was a girl I seriously dated for over a year after my divorce. We lived together and I cheated on her multiple times. And you know why? Because I chose to be a selfish asshole. Because I was selfish enough to put my own flippant carnal desires ahead of any feelings of moral responsibility. It was easy to be shitty. It almost always is. I put my desire to have sex with other women above my responsibility to honor the commitment of monogamy that I had made. Chose to be too chicken shit to man up and the relationship because I wanted You know, to have my cake and eat it too. I wanted the comfort of being in a relationship and have the sexual freedom of being single. I was a fucking dirtbag. I chose to be. I was super selfish and I can blame no one but myself ever for those choices. And you know what? Not fun to say that. Not fun to accept that. Doesn't feel good. Something I can't ever take back, but it happened. And the best I can do is just own it. Own my shit, apologize, learn from it, try to be much better going forward. But weak fucks like Bell just don't want to do that. That's why so many career criminals have a hard time making parole. They refuse to take responsibility for their bullshit. 
It's not Ed's fault that he chose to fuck barnyard animals as a kid. Not his fault he beat off in front of children. Not his fault he was murdering kids and raping them. Not his fault that he walked up to an ex-Marine he'd already shot four times for trying to stop him from hurting kids and then needlessly executed this unarmed man. Ed's the victim. Damn government and their fucking mind control experiments. It's all MK Ultra, man. CIA is making him do shit with his dick he didn't even want to do. Fuck Ed Bell. Wish he would have died a lot sooner than he did, painfully. Fuck all those guys to do shit like that and then don't have the balls to accept responsibility for it. Uh, For the bulk of those initial 70s killings, Ed Bell is the best suspect out there. Maybe someday genetic sleuthing will be done and he'll be positively identified as the killer. Would be nice to have some definitive closure. Uh, Now let's pop back into the timeline. Let's pick up the Texas killing fields uh, in the 80s right after a word from our final sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by Robinhood. Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, cryptos, all commission-free. While other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, Robinhood doesn't charge any commission fees, so you can trade stocks and keep all your profits. Plus, there is no account minimum deposit needed to get started, so you can invest at any level. The simple, intuitive design of Robinhood makes investing easy for newcomers and experts alike. View easy-to-understand charts and market data, place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. You can also view stock collections such as 100 Most Popular, With Robinhood, you can learn how to invest in the market as you build your portfolio. Discover new stocks, track your favorite companies, get custom notifications for price movements so you never miss the right moment to invest. Robinhood is giving listeners of TimeSuck a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint. To help you build your portfolio, sign up timesuck.robinhood.com. Now, it is time to jump back into today's TimeSuck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. November 1st, 1980. An unidentified murder victim, thought to be between 14 and 17 years old, was found dumped on I-45 about five miles north of Huntsville. She was nude, had been strangled with pantyhose, and had human bites on her body. She was five foot four inches tall, 110 pounds, and her body was found by a truck driver. This victim remains unidentified to this day. Now, Huntsville is 70 miles north of Houston, so this body was not found in the area primarily associated with the killing fields, but the body could have been taken from somewhere in that area. It was only an hour's drive away, and based on timeline, victim age, and certain murder details, this killing is listed in various timelines associated with the killing fields murders, which is why I included it here. On July 1st, 1982, 22-year-old Tamara Ellen McMurray uh, disappears in Galveston after seeing, uh, she was last seen getting into an orange or yellow van. She was never seen again. No one knows who took her or why. On October 7th, 1983, 25-year-old cocktail waitress Hedy Fye told her dad that she was going to hitch a ride into Houston to meet her boyfriend. Six months after Hedy vanished, a dog carried her skull out of the woods bordering nearby Calder Drive to a local home in League City, Texas. A few weeks later, on October 26, 1983, 14-year-old Sandra Ramber disappears from her house in Santa Fe, Texas, a small town 10 miles from League City. Her father reported her missing after he found the doors to their house unlocked when he arrived home from work. Biscuits were still cooking in the kitchen. Her new co- coat and her purse were exactly where she'd left them. She remains missing to this day as well. She just vanished. In July of 1984, 30-year-old Ellen Ray Beeson is last seen leaving a League City nightclub called the Texas Moon Club with a 31-year-old local construction worker named Clyde Hedrick. Remember that name. Ellen's remains were found a year later on the side of a dirt road in Galveston, and her murder remained unsolved until 2013 when Clyde was finally charged. He ended up getting a 20-year sentence for involuntary manslaughter in 2014, and the 65-year-old currently sits in prison and will hopefully die there. we we'll talk about him more later. A few months later, on September 1st, 1984, 16-year-old Laura Miller doesn't return home from school in League City. Her parents, Tim and Jan, call the police, start searching for their daughter. Tim's alarm grows when he learns that another young woman had disappeared in League City almost a year earlier, the just-mentioned Heedy Five. Tim was certain there was a link, but for whatever reason, local police insisted that no relationship existed between Fye's murder and Lori's disappearance, and we will soon find out they were wrong. On October 5th, 1985, 17-year-old Michelle Doherty Thomas is last seen leaving her Alta Loma home to meet friends on October 5th, 1985. She lived 10 miles from the League City killing field. She remains missing. On February 4th, 1986, Jan Miller read a Galveston County Daily News article stating that the decomposing body of an identified, unidentified woman had been discovered in the Calder Drive oil field on February 2nd, the same clearing in the woods where Hedy Fye's skeleton had been found. 
Jan Miller rushed to the League City Police Station and supplied investigators with her daughter's Laura, uh, with her daughter Laura's dental records and samples of their daughter's clothes. It was a match. They'd found their daughter. They clearly, there clearly did seem to be a relationship between Laura Miller and Hedy Fye's murders. Tim blamed the police for the agonizing months of waiting without answers. He said, the way I saw it, the police were partly responsible. It wasn't long after Laura disappeared that I asked them to look in that field. They wouldn't do it. Wouldn't let me do it. If they'd gone then, Laura would probably still have been dead, but they might have found evidence to stop the guy. At least we wouldn't have had all those months of jumping every time the phone rang. Instead, the cops did nothing. Now they had a third victim, a Jane Doe. Maybe if they'd done their jobs, she didn't have to die. And of course, this is a grieving father. So he's speaking from a very emotional place when he's saying this. Uh, I doubt the cops were doing nothing. That, that Jane Doe he's referring to is the victim we mentioned to start this suck. The 30-year-old mechanic, Audrey Lee Cook, whose remains were found right after Hedy Fies were, uh, remains were uncovered. The woman who was only finally identified this spring. News of the bodies found off Calder Drive spread. Months earlier, a new movie made headlines won a fistful of awards, The Killing Fields, documented the experiences of a Cambodian journalist after he escaped the Khmer Rouge and, and the finding of hundreds of thousands of his countrymen in mass graves. The press then began to refer to the League City clearing as the Texas Killing Fields. So that's where the name began. Also random trivia, Tim Miller and his wife Jan would go on to found EquiSearch a nonprofit search and rescue organization dedicated to searching for missing persons that is uh, a huge organization now. It's still based in Dickinson, Texas. EquiSearch has investigated more than 1,300 cases since forming in 2000, bringing hundreds of people home alive to grateful families, and they have also recovered more than 170 bodies. And to tie to another suck, in 2008, when Kaylee Anthony was reported missing, Tim Miller and EquiSearch volunteers traveled to Florida to look for her. And Miller uh, would interview Casey Anthony, would later say that from the beginning, Casey Anthony's father, George, suspected that his daughter Casey was involved in Kaylee's disappearance. When Miller explained to the Anthony family that they'd begun looking for a body instead of a living girl, Tim Miller remembers George calling Casey out of Casey's bedroom and telling her, Casey, tell Tim where to look. And instead of helping, Tim recalls Casey just angrily walked away. Casey Anthony, another person who just refuses to take responsibility for their evil actions. Please, Lucifina. Torment her for the rest of her life. In April of 1986, two months after investigators find the remains of Audrey Lee Cook, Laura Miller, and Hedy Fi in the League City killing field, police recover a headless body from a gar garbage bag in a state park in Galveston. That victim also remains unidentified. The next month, on May 24th, 1986, 19-year-old University of Texas student Shelly Kathleen Sykes goes missing just before midnight. She left her summer job at Guido's restaurant for her Texas city home, roughly 15 miles from the League City killing field, never made it. Her car was found on an I-45 northbound feeder road in the deep mud just north of the Santa Fe overpass. The car was blood sp uh, spattered and the driver's window was smashed. Her body was never recovered, but local men John Robert King and Gerald Peter Zwarst later were convicted of aggravated kidnapping, the most severe charge prosecutors could pursue without an actual body. The two men were sentenced to 40 years in prison, the maximum sentence for the crime, and both have been eligible for parole since 2007. Each time their parole comes up, the Sykes family protests, wanting them to serve out their full sentences. So far, they've both been denied parole every time. I doubt they have taken responsibility for their actions either. Fucking scumbags. On September 26, 1986, 15-year-old Lori Lee Tremblay is sexually assaulted and strangled by serial killer Anthony Allen Shore. Her body is dropped off behind a Houston Mexican restaurant Shore once lived in League City. Anthony would confess to four Texas murders and was prosecuted and found guilty for one in 2004. He was just recently executed by lethal injection in Texas on January 18th, 2018. Good riddance. On June 7th, 1987, 14-year-old Erica Ann Garcia disappears from a teen club in Houston. Her dead body is soon found behind a nearby vacant building. She'd also been strangled to death. Anthony Allen Shore not suspected in her death. Her killer remains unknown. October 7th, 1988, 22-year-old Suzanne Renee Richardson was working as a night clerk at the Casa del Mar condominiums in Galveston, where she was last seen at approximately 6 a.m. Another employee was sleeping in the room above Richardson's, uh, above the office, awoke to a scream, then a car door slammed from the parking lot and another scream before the car drove away. She left behind her purse, school books, and car. One of her shoes was found in the parking lot. She also remains missing. On September 19th, 1989, the body of another Jane Doe, thought to be between the ages of 14 and 19, is discovered in a wooded area on the east side of Houston. Cause of death was a gunshot wound to the head. 
estimated time of death sometime in the previous one to three months. No one has been charged with her murder. And now we're on to the 90s. The Killing Fields murders just keep coming. On September 8th, 1991, seven years after Laura Miller's disappearance, the daughter of those EquiSearch founders, a couple on horseback, cuts through the League City abandoned oil field, and they stumble upon the fourth victim to be pulled from that 25-acre patch of land. The badly decomposed body was in the same clearing only 300 feet from the first three bodies found there. This is the unidentified Jane Doe recently identified as 34-year-old mother of two, Donna Pudhami. Like about 90% of the other victims we've talked about from the 80s and now 90s, even though she was a little older, she was under 130 pounds, under 5'6", had long, light brown hair. I didn't include size and hair color with all the previous victims, but researching this, it was consistently, like almost every single one of the girls and young women who who were murdered or went missing were between 4'11 and 5'6", weighed between 100 and 130 pounds. They were considered usually uh, very pretty and almost always had long brown hair. If many of these killings were the work of one serial killer, he clearly had a type. While 1991's investigators couldn't figure out this girl's identity, they did come up with a prime suspect for her murder and the murder of many of the other girls and women from the previous decade, one Robert Abel. Robert Abel, interesting dude, retired NASA engineer with top security clearance who'd been working on America's space program since the early 60s. So he does look a little bad right now. He was clearly a member of the Baphomet-worshipping Illuminati who helped fake the fucking moon landings. Wake up, sheeple! Obviously capable of murder. No, I don't actually believe that. It's a little nod to a recent moon landing conspiracy side. Uh, Abel helped engineer the Saturn rocket that carried astronauts to the moon. If you buy that sort of shit... Uh, Abel leased acreage near the League City killing field beginning in 1983, the year Heidi, or Heidi, Phi, disappeared. He'd also taken a strong interest in the murder cases at times, lending horses to investigating officers and giving them unsolicited advice. In 1990, the year before Donna Prudhami's, uh, Prudhami's murder, uh, excuse me, Abel, Abel purchased the 11 acres directly adjacent to the killing field, opened stardust trail rides, guided horse rides, clearing away brush for paths through the woods and installing picnic tables. Abel also fit a new profile drawn up by FBI behavioral analysis unit profilers. The FBI, FBI believed that the man using the killing field as his private dumping ground was a methodical, organized, sexual serial killer, one with high intelligence who probably had a long history of abusing animals. Well, married three times, two of Abel's ex-wives told police that he was very violent with animals, allegedly beating his horses with pipes for even slight disobedience. Both women said Abel had a violent temper, said he would fly into rages. Neither claimed that he beat them, but his second wife did tell investigators that on their honeymoon, they got into an argument and Abel screamed at her, if you ever deny me sex again, I'll kill you. Pretty sure that attitude doesn't generally lead to more sex. Uh, What's that saying? You catch more flies with honey than than vinegar? I think that works for vaginas as well. I think if (laughs) if the nicer you are, the more more vaginas come your way. Or the more often a vagina comes your way. (laughs) To clear that up. Uh, Based on Abel matching the FBI profile and his alleged history of abuse, the League City Police uh, got a search warrant for his property in November of 1993. They found 22 caliber guns and bullets, the same caliber used to murder Donna Prudhami. They found some human teeth, which I don't think is a big deal. I'm actually wearing a a human tooth necklace under my shirt right now. I think it's cool. Uh, Newspaper clippings about the murders, uh, boxes of nude photos. The teeth, they reasoned, uh, could have been souvenirs taken from the victims. Or you know what? Fucking part of a nice, sexy tooth necklace. Listen, judgy people, we can't all afford diamonds or pearls. Some of us make do for fashion with whatever whatever human teeth we can get our dirty paws on. Despite what they did find, the police couldn't find any evidence directly tying Abel to uh, the killing field murders. They couldn't link the teeth with any known murders. (laughs) By the way, not illegal to have a little stash of chompers, no matter how creepy and guilty that makes you look. The bullet removed from Donna, either due to being exposed to acid while the body was being defleshed at the medical examiner's office or from just weathering in the field, no longer bore identifying marks that would have indicated whether or not it could have been fired from one of Abel's guns. While not a shred of hard evidence positively tied Abel to the murders, Tim Miller, in a 1999 interview, said, There are many days when I think about driving over there, putting a gun to his head, and pulling the trigger. When I'm near him, I feel like I'm in the presence of evil. And again, that's an EquiSearch founder. Clearly, this guy rubbed some people the wrong way. And there was a lot of suspicion around him. Robert Abel died in 2005 in what seems to be a suicide. A train struck Abel as he drove an ATV over a railroad crossing. The train engineer later uh, you know, told, told uh, investigators that Abel had braked next to the rail crossing 
you know, watching the train and then just, you know, popped out there at the last moment. Some think he killed those women in the 80s. Others think it may have been a ranch hand working for him. Mark Roland Stallings. More on Mark in a bit. Another interesting uh, suspect. Let's jump back into the 90s murders right now. On April 16th, 1992, the body of a 21-year-old or of 21-year-old Maria del Carmen Estrada is found behind a Houston Dairy Queen. She had been walking to work when Anthony Allen Shore, that son of a bitch we've already talked about, that known serial killer founder, Shore would later say in court that she, quote, freaked out when he made sexual advances towards her, but that he was able to overpower her, rape her, and strangle her. On May 13th, 1994, 16-year-old Trellis Sykes gets abducted on the way to school in Houston. Her dead body is found later the same day in an area field. Her killer remains unknown. The body of another one of Shore's rape and strangulation victims, 16-year-old Dana Sanchez, is found in Houston's Northview Park. The last time she was seen alive, she was talking to her boyfriend on a payphone, told him she planned to hitchhike to his home, but never arrived. On August 7th, 1994, the body of yet another one of Anthony Shore's victims, nine-year-old, God, nine-year-old, Diana Raballer is found in Houston. Her mom had sent her to a nearby convenience store to buy some sugar, and then she'd been raped, beaten, and strangled. On February 3rd, 1996, the bodies of 14-year-old Lynette Bibbs and 15-year-old Tamara Fisher are found. They disappeared two days earlier. The remains have been dumped on the uh, side of a rural road near Cleveland, Texas. They were last seen leaving a teen club in Houston on February 1st. Their bodies were both found partially clothed. Lynette had been shot twice in the back of the head, once in the thigh. Tamara had been shot once in the head. Their murders remain unsolved. So many murders. On March 5th, 1996, 13-year-old Crystal Jean Baker dis uh, disappears from the convenience store or a convenience store in Texas City where she'd stopped in to use a payphone. She was calling a friend, hoping for a ride to a friend's house in nearby Bayou Vista. Her friend couldn't pick her up. And then her body was found a few hours later under the I-10 bridge over the Trinity River. She had been strangled, beaten, sexually assaulted, and killed by ligature strangulation. Her face in particular had been badly beaten. The closest highway from where she was last seen was I-45. Random trivia, Marilyn Monroe, a.k.a. Norma Jean Baker, former suck subject, was Crystal's great aunt on her father's side. And everyone always said how Crystal looked like a young Marilyn Monroe. Police ran a DNA test on some of Crystal's fingernail scrapings on some the semen found on the flower dress she wore that last day of her life, and they got a match. It was 29-year-old Kevin Edison Smith. Kevin had been arrested before in Louisiana. That's why his DNA was in the uh, database. There were no sex offenses or truly violent crimes on his record. He grew up in a Various little towns bordering I-45, spending most of his childhood in the Texas City area. Graduated high school in Galveston. Smith confessed to killing Crystal, but, but claimed it was accidental. Again, you know, it's not his fault. He said he was just sitting on a bench outside a little corner store with some other smokers, enjoying a cigarette with his beer, when he saw a girl walking down the highway. He then bought a 24-ounce beer for the road, drove off in his green Chevy extended cab pickup truck, approached Crystal, offered her a ride. Smith said he thought Crystal was 18 and possibly a prostitute and that he charmed her into the back seat and then wanted her to give him a blowjob. He said she didn't want to give him a blowjob, so he forced himself on her, and then she fought him, kicking and biting. He said then he started choking her, but didn't mean to kill her. But then he said, you know, the next thing I knew, she stopped breathing. Reading about this guy reminded me how important it is to be a good parent. I know that might sound random, but some of these criminals, I almost feel sorry for them because of how fundamentally fucked up their view of reality is. Like when you read this dude's full confession, you can tell that he just expected the cops to have a very different reaction than he did. Like he thought like, yeah, I was just doing some pretty normal stuff and she kind of reacted crazy and things got out of hand. You know, like, like the police are going to be like, wait, wait, what? What? Hold up. Hold up, kid. She wouldn't give you a blowjob. That's fucking crazy, Kevin. I mean, you said you'd pay her, right? And then she got in your car. She drank some of your beer, right? <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? We're sorry we brought you in today. I mean, I, I don't, I don't really see a crime here. Uh, it, it is weird to think about how sometimes when you run somebody into the street, you know, they can be the exact same species you are. Same age, live in the same country, live in the same neighborhood. They can look the same as you, but they can live in a completely different fucking world in their head because of how they were raised and how they were wired or how they are wired, I guess. God, just the way some people talk is like, hey, man, yeah, no, here, let me, can, let me tell you some stuff. It's no big deal. You know, I thought she was a prostitute. I thought she was old enough. Sure, I was slapping around as, as one does when they pick up a woman. Uh, investigators interrogated Kevin about some of the other I-45 murders, but he denied there were any more to discuss. He was charged and tried for the rape and first degree murder of Crystal. The jury did not buy his, hey, I thought she was a prostitute, so it's okay to choke her, right? Uh, kind of creepy defense, and then gave him life in prison after deliberating for about 20 minutes, and he remains in prison today. Hopefully, will die in prison. Also in March of 1996, a 13-year-old girl was abducted at gunpoint as she was walking home from a shopping center. She leaped out of a truck in LaPorte, Texas, 
Police officers just happened to be driving by the truck, witnessed the girl falling out of the truck. The officer attended to the girl, which sadly did allow the driver to get away in a green Ford Ranger. The man was described as being 35 to 45, six feet, six feet, two inches tall, with gray and black hair and a beard. Neither the man nor the truck were ever seen again after this incident. On April 3rd, 1997, 12-year-old aspiring ballerina Laura Kate Smither disappeared while jogging near her home in Friendswood, Texas, near I-45. 17 days later, her body is found at the edge of a retention pond in Pasadena near I-45. Nude except for one sock, head decapitated. Dark colored pickup observed in the same area she was last seen. Her remainder, her, god dang it, her murder also remains. That's the word I was trying to say too fast. Unsolved. On May 16th, 1997, 19-year-old Sandra Sapa is abducted. She was fixing a flat on NASA Road 1 in Webster, Texas, near I-45, when a man named William Lewis Reese kidnapped her by pulling a knife on her, forcing her into his truck. He ordered her to undress, but she opened the passenger door, jumped out of the fast-moving truck, and lived. Reese was charged with aggravating kidnapping, and some think he also murdered 12-year-old Laura Kate Smither. On August 17th, 1997, 17-year-old Jessica Lee Kane goes missing after leaving a friend's or leaving some friend's company at Bennigan's restaurant in Webster around 2 a.m. Two hours later, her truck was found along I-45 in Lamarck. There were no signs of struggle. Her truck was operational. Witnesses saw her walking from her parked truck towards a Red Isuzu Amigo that was stopped behind her truck, never been seen or heard from since. On November 29th, 1998, 23-year-old Tina Flood is found beaten and barely alive in the front passenger seat of Jonathan David Drew's car after police pull him over, a waitress she'd befriended Drew at a nightclub. She died days later, and Drew is convicted for her death. Drew is also suspected of several other sexual assaults, and it is speculated he could be responsible for the disappearance of Jessica Lee Kane and possibly several of the Killing Field's murders. A search of his former home in League City, very close to the primary Killing Field, where his parents still lived, did produce a vial containing several human teeth. A lot of teeth judgment in this suck is the only thing I don't like about it. It's almost making me feel bad about wearing a tooth necklace. Jonathan Drew, sentenced to life in prison for felony murder, remains in prison in Texas today. January 17th, 1999, 18-year-old Wanda Mae Pitts worked in the lobby desk at the Lodge Motel just off of I-45 in Shenandoah, Texas, when drifter William Ray Matthews abducts her, takes her to one of the motel rooms, sexually assaults her before strangling her to death, then hides her body and her body would not be found for a year. A few weeks after Wanda's murder, William Ray Matthews tries to abduct 21-year-old Tracy Vickery, tries to take her from the office where she works selling mobile homes. Tracy's office was located uh, across I-45 from the Lodge Motel. This guy came with a briefcase, sat down, wrote her a note. She was to do what he said because he had a gun and would kill her if she did not. He tried to force Tracy into his truck, then he drove off. He did force her in the truck, drove out down I-45, but she was able to leap quickly from the moving truck. He tried to pull her back in by her hair, but then she fought him off and escaped. Good thing she did fight him off because she would have for sure died at his hands. Matthews was apprehended shortly after failing to kill Tracy, and then he ended up getting a plea deal from authorities and received two 50-year sentences for aggravated kidnapping and robbery. His projected release date is 2049 when he'll be 88 years old. He's in prison in Texas. Now we're in the 2000s. Man, so many, so many crimes in this one little area. Five more women have been killed or have disappeared in the area of the I-45 killing since 2000. Just going to burn through these quick here. 57-year-old Tot Tran Harriman disappeared after visiting her son in League City, Texas on July 12, 2001. 23-year-old Sarah Trusty murdered in Algoa sometime between July 12, 2002, when she was last seen riding her bike to church, and July 28, 2002, when her body was found in Texas City. 13-year-old Laura Ayala. Ay- Ayala went missing from South Houston on May 10th, 2002. Never been seen or heard from since. 16-year-old Maria Salas went missing after getting off a city bus in Houston to go to school in the spring of 2003. Students and a nearby motel manager heard her scream as someone abducted her. Her dead body was found 20 miles southwest of Houston on August 13th, 2003. Then the body of 30-year-old elementary school teacher Natasha Solidum was found floating in the surf near where I-45 ends in Galveston on February 23rd, 2006. She'd been shot, and the medical examiner determined she'd only been dead for a few hours when she was found. And Natasha seems to be. Based on every book and article I can find, based on a variety of Google searches, the last of the Texas Killing Fields murder victims. So let's hop out of this timeline, look at two more suspects. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Oh, 
Okay, if you will recall earlier, we've been tossing out a lot of names, a lot of dates, a lot of people here, but I did say, I remember the name Clyde Hedrick. I mentioned him earlier. I said he was the, uh, the former NASA employee and possible murder Robert Abel's ranch hand, the guy who, who definitely murdered 30-year-old Ellen Ray Beeson in 1984, this Clyde guy. He's a guy who, if you do a Google image search for him and look at any picture of him, <laughs> you have no doubt about his guilt. He looks like someone who has spent the last few decades doing just doing nothing but murdering, thinking about murdering, beating off the thoughts of murder, and listening to bands like Cinderella, 38 Special, and Winger while doing one of the things I already mentioned. He just looks like a fucking weird butt rock psychopath. In 1977, Hedrick was convicted of attempted arson, sentenced to five years in a Florida prison, and doing a lot of meth, by the way, in those earlier things, and doing daily meth the whole time. 1974, when Killing Field's 16-year-old murder victim, Laura Miller, disappeared, when Clyde did for sure kill Beeson, at that time, Clyde lived just down the block from the house the Millers had recently moved out of in Dickinson, so he clearly was familiar with Laura Miller. Laura's dad, EquiSearch founder Tim Miller, has in recent years come to believe that Clyde, not Robert Abel, is the man who not only killed his daughter, but probably many other women. This is Tim's logic, and I gotta say it is pretty sound. Tim has spent a lot of time looking over this, had a lot of years to think. He defy. This is a name we've talked about several times. He disappeared in October 1983. Known Clyde victim Ellen Beeson disappeared in July 1984. Laura Miller disappeared in September 1984. Audrey Lee Cook, that 30-year-old mechanic known until recently as Jane Doe, died sometime in late 1985 or 1986. Three of these women's remains all found in the same abandoned oil, killing, oil field killing field in League City. Also, the Texas Moon Club, the nightclub where Hendrick, uh, Hedrick me, uh, met murder victim Beeson, was the same nightclub that Heedy Five frequently drank and danced at. This was her place as well. They were there at the same time many times. Probably definitely knew each other. Also, on his recurring searches of the Calder Drive field, Tim Miller discovered piles of discarded tiles stripped off of roofs. Now, at the time of the murders, all of those murders, Clyde Hedrick worked for a local roofing contractor. Before he went to Robert Abel, to worked as a ranch hand, he worked as a local roofing contractor, Tim thinks that maybe Klein was using the field to dump garbage from his jobs and then could also visit where he'd left the bodies of the girls. Then, there's, there's more to it than that, than after his 2013 arrest, while looking at a newspaper article about EquiSearch and Tim Miller, while he's being held you know, in, in, in jail, three separate inmates claim that Clyde nonchalantly stated that he did have sex with and did murder Tim's daughter, Laura. Just fucking said it. During the same conversation, Hedrick allegedly also admitted to killing Heidi Fye and clubbing Ellen Beeson to death with a table leg. However, the word of three other felons just wasn't enough to file charges on the other murders. You know, Clyde wouldn't repeat these confessions to authorities, and he hasn't been charged with those crimes. Also, Clyde was charged with involuntary manslaughter and not murder for Ellen Beeson's death because they couldn't prove that Clyde did intend to kill her. It's a shame that this obvious fucking dirtbag could live long enough to get out of prison. He's 65 right now. He's projected to be released in 14 years when he'll be 79. So that guy looks, uh, you know, pretty guilty. Now for one last suspect in some of the other murders, some of the later murders, Mark Roland Stallings. Stallings had been once a hired hand on Robert Abel's. Oh yeah. So sorry. I get there's so many fucking dirtbags in this episode. <laughs> it's hard to keep them straight. Clyde was not a later ranch hand. I keep getting, uh, when I was doing this, going over, I kept getting Clyde and Mark kind of uh, confused. Clyde, just weird, mullety, meth, uh, weird roofer guy. Mark, ranch hand with Robert Abel, another creep. Possible creep. Stalins had once been a hired hand on Robert Abel's uh, League City Horse Ranch. According to a 2001 police report, while in prison on other charges, Stalins confessed to the Killing Fields murders of the 1980s, but no charges were ever filed. We think Stallings did at least one of the murders, said Lieutenant Tommy Hansen at the Galveston County Sheriff's Office, the same Galveston Sheriff's investigator uh, that handled Clyde Hedrick's case. We believe he murdered Donna Prudhami, but he refused to sign a confession. And so far, we don't have the hard evidence we need to charge him. So a lot of times, like, fuck, why can't they? They said they did it. It's legal kind of red tape stuff. You know, they didn't sign it. They didn't do it in the right way. And when it goes to court, they have enough experience to know that sadly, a lot of times these things won't stick based on defense attorney maneuvering. In the mid 80s, Stallings was in his early 20s, married with two children, working as a laborer. He says, I got involved with this guy. We got to know each other, smoke pot and stuff like that. We'd go out on occasion, get blasted. 
there was this one prostitute I used to mess with. Her street name was Champagne, and Stallings described her as a white woman with an olive complexion, real pretty and real nice. And he said that one night, Champagne got in the truck with him and this other guy, and that they drove off to an abandoned trailer. Once they arrived, Champagne, possibly realizing something was amiss, refused to have sex with the men. They had other plans, though. Stallings pulled the woman out of the truck, forced her towards the trailer, while the other man yelled at him to hurry before someone saw them. Inside the trailer, she still refused to do what they wanted, and they fought. And Stallings said, I slammed her upside the head, I slammed her upside the wall, beat her, threw her into the back bedroom, and then the men raped her. Stallings said this other man was Robert Abel, the man who, you know, for a decade would be the prime suspect in some of the killing field murders. And he said that after forcing himself on Champagne, he left and that Robert stayed. Stallings said he'd gotten to know Robert pretty well, saying that Robert had a dark side like I had a dark side. Before too long, we became more than boss and employee. And Stallings claims that he learned that Abel, uh, you know, shared his view of women, saying he'd tell me stuff like women wa always want to dominate the world, make the decisions, tell a man when he can touch him, when he can't. I said, I know, I understand. I could feel the darkness in Robert. I was relating to that. I was thriving off that. These fucking dirtbags. And, and then that night with Champagne, when Stallings left, he claims that Robert said, I want to keep her overnight. And then the next day, Abel seemed on edge. And before long, Stallings says, Abel told him, man, I killed that girl. And according to Stallings, this prostitute's real name was Donna Prudhami. Later in 1991, Stalling was convicted of burglary. Then in 1996, he was back in a Texas prison for possession of a firearm and for shooting an old man through a window, wounding but not killing him. What a weird fucking crime, by the way. Shooting an old man through a window. There's got to be some story around that. That just sounds like the most pathetic, shitty, like cowardly thing. Like, I feel like even other hardened felons would look down on that. Like, dude, why you got to be a fucking dick, man? Who, showed, who shoots an old man through a window? I strangled three women, kicked a kid down the stairs once. I would never shoot an old man through a window. Uh, while incarcerated, serving two 50-year sentences in 1998, Stallings tried to escape, taking a guard hostage with a smuggled-in gun and holding her for four hours. And then he got three convictions, uh, additional convictions, aggravated assault, aggravated kidnapping, sentenced to life. He will never get out. His projected release date is January 1st, 9999. And that's all the suspects. So there's, there's, I mean, there are guys that have, I mean, there's definitely a fair amount of murders that are completely unknown, but there are a lot of guys who have confessed these murders that were in the right place, were in the right time, did commit other crimes, were committed sometimes of other murders, but just because of, you know, legal kind of, again, you know, uh, situations were never brought to trial and never actually convicted. So about, about half of these, you know, uh, disappearances of murders, we, we got a pretty good idea of who did it. Uh, and then the other half, who knows? Who knows if they'll ever be solved? And, and that is pretty much it for the Texas killing fields. I mean, a lot of deaths, a lot of disappearances, a lot of suspects, quite a few people put behind bars, a lot of evil. You know, like with the alphabet murders, what disturbs me most about this suck is just the combination of the amount of victims and the amount of dirt bags involved and they're just callousness towards human life in one little area in one small overall period of time. Like, like, God, like, like, like it's just so common in a way. And I know most people are great. Most of the world really is, you know, good people. But man, these, these fucking dirtbags really stand out, you know? I mean, God, hopefully you can't even imagine actually grabbing a young girl, pulling her screaming into a van, hitting her until she's quiet, choking her, putting a gun in her face, raping her as she fights and screams and cries and ending her life and then tossing out her body like a piece of trash somewhere. I mean, to, to go to that place in your fucking head. You know, I've gotten several emails I've, I've never shared over the course of this show from people saying the equivalent of, oh, it must be nice to be so judgy towards these criminals when you clearly haven't suffered from severe mental illness or been born with certain urges or been raised a certain way or been victimized a certain way yourself. And, and to address that for starters, yeah, yeah, it is nice. I, I have been very lucky in life in a variety of ways. But also to me, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to me what mental illness you have or what you've been through. If what you end up doing is something like abducting and then raping and killing a little girl, you're, you're sick. Might not be your fault that you're sick, but you're very sick. And your sickness is going to forever cause you to hurt more innocent people. And because of that, I think you got to die. I really do. I think the only cure for your particular disease is death. And if your death deters at least one other person from committing a similar crime, to me, morally righteous. Even if it doesn't, 
uh, deter at least one of the person committing a similar crime. If you've done that stuff, regardless of the mental things you're going on, I just, I don't fucking think that you should be able to stay alive. I don't. Protect the innocent. That to me is one of the most fundamentally important functions of a healthy government and a healthy society. Protect the innocent. And sometimes the best way to do that is to kill the guilty. So hail Nimrod. May all those poor girls and all the others we probably just don't even know about rest in peace. And let's get now to today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, between 1971 and 2006, over 30 girls and young women disappeared between Houston and Galveston, an area still known to true crime fans as the Texas Killing Fields. Number two, the most likely suspect for the majority of the 1970s Texas Killing Fields murders is Ed jerking off in front of kids in the middle of the goddamn street, all part of the program Bell, a dude who just died in prison back on April 20th. Good riddance. Uh, Number three, Matthew motherfucking McConaughey helped catch Ed fucking animals back at the family ranch bell when he portrayed the ex-Marine Ed shot in cold blood on Unsolved Mysteries. All right, all right, all right. Sleep tight, America. McConaughey's on lookout. Number four, creepy Clyde Hair Metal Hedrick, the main suspect for the murders that involved bodies being dumped in that 25-acre abandoned League City oil field that gave the whole region as Texas Killing Field initial name. And the rest of the murders seemed to be the result of the work of many different killers. Way too many dirtbags out there. And number five, new info. It's going to be random, but you can actually buy a variety of real human teeth necklaces on the web. I shit you not. I was blown away with how many results came up when I Googled human teeth necklace. Actually, by the time I finished human teeth, it's apparently so common of a search that Google auto-filled in the word necklace. I know this has nothing to do with the killing fields, but I found it fascinating. For 36 bucks, you can buy a necklace that has 10 different human molars on it. It's on Etsy right now. One of many. And I wanted to know where all these jewelers were getting all these fucking teeth. So then I Googled, which I'm sure this put me on some kind of weird list, wholesale human teeth. And on eBay, some motherfucker known as Piara is selling a set of 68 human teeth for $170. And I'm so fucked up from doing this show for too long that the first thing I wondered when I saw that was, is that a good deal for that many teeth? I don't even know. What's the going rate on fucking teeth? And that is all for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Texas killing fields have been sucked. I hope you did our space lizards proud. Uh, they've been trying to vote in this topic for months. These, these true crime mysteries always uh, make me a little nervous because I am so addicted to a sense of finality. Like, uh, like when I watch movies, I don't like movies that have, have an open ending. It makes me mad every time. And you know, like in, in these kind of stories, when it's just a lot of like, yeah, so that there you go. They're gone. We don't know. We just don't know. I'm just always like, oh, I, don't, I don't like that as an ending, but that is the ending. That's just uh, what it is. Dark topic for sure. Based on modern genetic te- te- yeah, detective work capabilities, we may get more endings someday. I- I'm guessing more and more of, you know, just cold cases in general are going to be solved like a lot more. And hopefully a lot more of these cases will be solved. You know, some of them are going to forever. The missing ones, I mean, sadly, sometimes the body is just going to decompose to the point that there's going to be nothing left. So there's going to be nothing to find to solve these. But uh, hopefully more families will get the small consolation prize of at least knowing who did it. And hopefully in time for more people to be brought and put in to prison. Uh, thanks to the Time Suck team. Thanks to the Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Camp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alex Dugan, the guys at Bit Elixir, Danger Brain, Axis Apparel, Zach, Script Keeper Flannery. Thanks to Heather Knowledge Ninja Rylander for gathering the best info from the best source to get me started on today's research. And next week, we focus on another dirt bag. This is one dirt bag. This week, many dirt bags. Next week, one dirtbag, and oh, what a preposterous dirtbag he is. Austrian piece of shit, Joseph Fritzl. And and let me apologize now for the back-to-back darkness. I picked out Fritzl and started research before I knew the spaces were going to vote in the Texas killing fields. Be gone, Lucifina! Oh, this, this, I, I am weirdly fascinated and have been for a long time with this Fritzl case. It's so fucking ridiculous. So terrible. The Fritzl case emerged in April of 2008 when a 42-year-old woman named Elizabeth Fritzl told police in the town 
of Amstetten, Austria, that she had been held captive for 24 years by her father, Joseph Fritzl, and she was not lying. Joseph had abducted his own daughter when she was 18 and went to leave the house and then held her captive underneath his home in a secret apartment he had turned into the soundproof basement for over two fucking decades, had seven kids with her, and the kids stayed in the basement too. And Elizabeth's mother, Joseph's wife, had no idea the whole time that her daughter and her grandkids were directly underneath her as she slept every single night. For over two decades, Elizabeth never saw the light of day one time. The story is absolutely insane. We will dig into it next week. Right now, we're going to dig into today's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Okay, this first update, we've got several today, comes in from Daniel Darby who lets me know that there is more to the concept of universal basic income that I brought up in the homelessness suck last week than I was aware of. Daniel writes, hey, Dan, I just finished listening to the suck on homelessness, and I've got to say, ha, 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 fuck them. I'm kidding. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to say I felt the same way as you about the idea of universal basic income, but I looked into the Democratic candidate, Andrew Yang, whose website is extremely extensive and easy to use. After seeing how he broke it down, looking through a lot of his other ideas, he is who I'm going to vote for in the primaries. If you have the time, listen to him on the Joe Rogan podcast. He goes through and crunches the numbers of how it would work and pay for itself. Now I love the idea. Thanks for all you do, Daniel. Uh, Well, thank you, Daniel. You know, I did did look up uh, Yang, looked into this one policy uh, on Yang 2020. And, and, And full disclosure on my end, I have no idea what this guy stands for on any platform whatsoever. I just looked into this one uh, universal, because I was just curious about this concept of universal basic income. And he does have a great website, yang2020.com, very user-friendly and informative. I just, I do like how he spells out the information. Again, haven't taken the time to look into anything more, but, and, and, and way too much info for me to get into and share here. And I'm not going to, you know, share info on like, you know, candidates, but uh, if you're curious about the concept of universal, universal basic income, you could check it out. He, he has an interesting concept regarding this, some kind of 10% value added tax that would supposedly create another $800 billion in annual tax revenue, mostly by not allowing giant corporations to hide profit. Again, I don't know if it would work. I do like the concept of not letting huge, huge companies like Amazon and Walmart and whatever, not to just squirrel away and use all these kind of you know secrets to kind of hide their tax money and just put all that pressure on everyday kind of working people. Um, and, and I like you putting that knowledge for, for me to share with everybody else out there, Daniel. Thank you. Hail Nimrod. Now a quick evolution correction update from longtime sucker and and the brilliant, I think, Thomas Fogg, who writes, hey, Dan, quick update on evolution and the science behind it. You did a really good job overall of explaining evolution as a whole, with the exception of two major issues. First and most importantly, we did not evolve for monkeys. There are three major types of evolution, covergent, divergent, and parallel. Monkeys and our closer relatives, apes, are a good example of divergent evolution. We had a similar or possibly the same ancestor in the past, which is why we have superficial commonalities, but monkeys, apes, and humans are all genetically very different. A good example of convergent evolution, which is one of the coolest representations of different species developing superficial commonalities, is the ichthyosaur and dolphins. These are species that lived millions of years apart in separate taxonomy classes. uh, Ichthyosaurs are believed to be reptiles. Even most sharks and dolphins have superficial similarities, but the skin-deep comparisons are where they end. Secondly. Your example of believing in magic and comparing it to believing in creationism is a false equivalence. Having faith in magic is different because you are believing in something that is not disprovable. We can't prove magic doesn't exist and there'd be no experiment to set up to say otherwise. However, we can prove that the creation of the earth being measured as less than 10,000 years ago is in fact a myth. We have a mountain of evidence to support that. This is not to say that we can't allow for both things to be true. At the live Ant Hill Kids Suck, you mentioned the leader mistaking the calculation for the end of the world because he forgot it was measured in God time. While he was obviously a complete fucking Looney Tune, there is a biblical precedent for God time. In Peter 3.8, God is said to view a day as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. That is to say, God is not a being of time. Rather, he is out of time and not governed by our universe or its physical laws. Similarly, in astrophysics, we didn't know, or we know, excuse me, that time didn't exist until after the Big Bang. 
meaning chronologically, things happened before time existed because time is an illusionary effect of gravity and gravity didn't exist until there were things and my, my fucking brain just uh, folded in on itself. And then uh, it's not important enough to go down that rabbit hole right now. Thank God. Uh, the point is, one can say that the universe took seven God time days to make, but that this could be billions of years to the outside or rather inside perspective. We are beings that are governed by the physical laws that are made by our universe. So maybe 14 billion years, our time is less than 10,000 years. God time, just an outside perspective as someone who was raised Christian. If you really want to give yourself a headache, take some time and look into the paradoxical age of the earth because of the time gravity differential between the crust and the core. Jesus Christ. See how relativity uh, relativity made a man experience milliseconds less time in space and directly compared to people who have never left the earth. I'm not asking people to give up their faith. I'm just asking that we just and move towards the future of steam, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. After all, talking about teaching creationism in school is what led to the formation of the church of the flying spaghetti monster or the pastafarian church. If we can teach as fact, what was written in a book of faith, why shouldn't I be allowed to teach kids the world was made by an invisible flying spaghetti monster with noodles for a body and meatballs for eyes 200 years ago? Sorry, my emails are always too long. I just hope it gets you thinking like someone who can bridge a gap between atheists and monotheists and polytheists. Thank you for your time and all that you do, Thomas Fogg. Ah, uh, wow. Well, Tom, what a fucking dumb email. That was a waste of time. Fucking, what were you thinking? Usually you write in smart shit. That was, that was fucking dumb. Ha <laughs> ha! Dumb! Uh, kidding, <laughs> kidding. That was very smart, very smart, uh, smarter than me. I, I, you know, I met Tom, and even though Thomas says he's no genius, I strongly beg to differ. Thomas has sent in a lot of emails over the last few years, and you know, sometimes you just meet some some uh, buddy, and you're just like, my God, this person's working at another level. Uh, I think Thomas is one of those people. If I was really a cult leader and wanted a strong mental consultant, he'd be a prime candidate. That was be beautifully written as usual, Thomas. Such a great, uh, you know, various points to think about. I love your message of coexistence. And the way you laid it all out, I love that, yeah, that we can have this uh, gap bridge between atheists, monotheists, polytheists. Love it, love it, love it. Hail Nimrod, you beautiful meat sack. Hayden Nelson has another Darwin update. Hayden writes, hello, Master Sucker and Hail Nimrod. I was listening to the Darwin podcast and would like to clarify something. I would like to first say that I am an evolution-believing space lizard that is currently getting a microbiology degree. I am also Christian. The thing I would like to address is the fact that there are two forms of evolution, macro and micro. The differences between the two of these are very important. Macroevolution is defined as the evolution outside of one's set DNA parameters. While microevolution is the evolution inside one's set DNA parameters. While microevolution is basically scientific law at this point, macroevolution is an unconfirmed hypothesis at best. There are two main reasons that macroevolution is generally not believed to be a, uh, a law by the scientific community. The first is the fact that DNA cannot be added to an organism. Some people would point to mutations as a means to add DNA, but in reality, all a mutation is, is the adding of currently existing nucleotide base where there shouldn't be one, resulting in unstable or varied proteins. The second reason that macroevolution is not held to be true is because of the lack of intermediate links. If we really did evolve from a single cell organism through mutations, there would be intermediate links where you could see the changes taking place in the fossil and animal remains. The problem is that almost none of these links have been discovered. And none of them have major alterations that would point to macroevolution. I would like to say here that I respect the hell out of Charles Darwin. He was an amazing scientist that paved the way for a new line of DNA research, found an entirely new scientific law. I hope that this adds a little more knowledge to your brain. And I would love to answer any questions you may have and hear any arguments because the scientific community grows daily and I know so little. Your humble little meat sack and Bojangles to chew toy, Hayden. P.S. If you read this on the podcast, my full name is Hayden Nelson. Feel free to share with as many people as you would like. I would love to have a conversation with anyone who wants to. P.P.S. I think I'm the youngest space lizard, 17. If there is another young space lizard, post on the Facebook group. That's the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group. The link is in the episode description, and I'll hit you up. Hayden Nelson. Holy shit, Hayden. Good work, young man. My God, fucking smarties. I will say that there, uh, that there is a debate. I do hope some people find, yeah, please find Hayden on the, on the Facebook group. Hayden, post in there. Say, say you know, on, on, after this episode comes out on Monday, get active in there and meet, meet some people. Meet some, meet some youngins. I will say, yeah, that there is, a, is, is quite a bit of debate about this whole macro evolution. I, you made me look into it. Maybe you and Thomas Fogg should fucking find each other and have a, have a science off. Uh, I found a post in a chat room that sums up part of the debate in a way better than I can. Someone posted, it's all micro evolution. If people can accept one small change, how about 10, 100, 1,000? What happens when there are 100,000 small changes over many generations? 
All those changes add up until you get two different species, and from there, a dozen different species, then new families, and finally, something that does not resemble its initial ancestor at all. Does that make sense, Hayden? I, I, I'm sure you're already probably familiar with that. Uh, and I'll be honest, science was the hardest subject for me in school. I do my best, but when, you, when, when I get too far into the hood, I start feeling a little dizzy. Uh, I like your inquisitive nature. I like the point you raise. And uh, is macroevolution unproven or is it a logical result of many microevolutions? I guess that is a debate and there are believers on both sides of this argument. Uh, thanks for making us think. Hail Nimrod. Lot to be learned still with evolution. N- now another homeless update from Time Sucker Victor Sanchez. Victor writes, Dear Master Sucker, thank you for your informative podcast on the homelessness epidemic in America. As usual, your podcast was funny and thoughtful at the same time. There clearly is not an easy solution to the problem. And like you, I waver between wanting to help people, but at the same time, not wanting low-income housing in my neighborhood. My only thought to improve situations like that is to not have a concentrated section of low-income housing and homelessness in one area. I think all that does is bring desperate people who may have mental health or substance abuse issues together in one spot may make them more likely to reoffend. Along with counseling and job skills training, there also needs to be a program on how to reintegrate the homeless back into society. I'm not a bleeding heart liberal, but I do think it's better to have all members of society have enough to survive and have them be active participants in their communities. Thanks again for your thoughtful commentary. If I make uh, Victor Sanchez. Oh, and Victor also says, if I may make a suggestion on a topic, would you at some point do a suck on socialist countries like Norway or Sweden? I think, he says, I think Sweden, I know that they get a lot of attention for providing their people with plenty of social services and paid family leave, but I would be curious if that could ever work in a large, diverse population like the U.S. Well, thank you, Victor. Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting point you bring up about mixing kind of neighborhoods. And, and I know, by the way, many of you have sent in emails. We're recording this on a Wednesday right after this came out. So I will have in next week's Time suck in the updates. Many more possible homelessness solutions. I, I glanced right before this episode and saw that a bunch were coming in. One of them specifically related uh, to that uh, low-income housing is not always people going through problems. Uh, somebody with personal experience. Um, but I like mixing up the neighborhoods. Yeah, if it's not all concentrated in one area, that is something to really think about. Socialism suck. Great idea. Good excuse to look into why those Nordic countries always seem to rank so high on happiness scales is what they're doing over in, the, in those countries applicable to what's going on in this country. Um, okay. Uh, and now, so hail Nimrod to you. Another homeless update from time sucker in spaces or Jeff Driscoll. Jeff writes, greetings, apostle, apostle of Nimrod, wrangler of Bojangles, defender of knowledge, possible incubus of Lucifina. It is I, your loyal spaces or Jeff, long time listener of your comedy, circa revenge is near. Oh man, thank you. The homeless epidemic really hit home for me. After serving four years in the army, I was met with the obstacle of divorce at a very young age. It started right before I got out. I didn't have the support I required to stay on my own two feet. I had to hitchhike a four hour car ride back to my hometown almost immediately after deciding to break it off. During the trip, inclement weather had me stuck in a small town in central New York for almost a week. During that time, I stayed at a 24 hour laundromat where I was using everything I had to literally just do my laundry several times and would utilize the showering facilities at a local YMCA to prevent suspicion I was just looking for a warm place to stay. Once the weather cleared up, I went back on the road, finally caught my break. A state trooper pulled over, checked my info, heard my story, drove me the last 90 miles to where I was going. It was after that time where I found my new purpose and had to make it up to that meat sack for driving me to my hometown. I pleaded with my family to let me stay with them and got straight to work. In order to support myself in divorce proceedings, I picked up four jobs and worked harder than I have ever worked in my entire life. I'm extremely thankful that now I'm positioned in a place of success and I'm dating my sexy space lizard comrade, Cat. This suck sucked me so deep on things that to this day, I've never even gave myself time to think about until just now. I was only in the laundromat for five days. There was little stopping me from just pitching a hasty shelter near the late night liquor store, buying a cheap bottle of grandpa's cold medicine and living off peanut butt butter <laughs> for the rest of my life. Showbiz. Uh, I already hate math, but the math and statistics that you brought up made me want to swear it off forever. After looking back, I was financially and emotionally similar at best to the McFubars just in that five day span. I get anxiety just thinking about that. One thing that you didn't mention this suck that is totally uh, overlooked in solutions that we can do as individuals is to become role models for people in need. My first role model in that tough time was the meat sack state trooper that gave me a chance. And I hope to one day be as positive of an influence on at least one person as he was on me. If that person could spend two hours of their time to make a change in me that is lasting a lifetime, 
Imagine if other meat sacks spent 20 minutes and 10 bucks buying a person a meal at a McDonald's. This was an awesome suck. I'm looking forward to our secret meeting this Thursday. Please keep being the pro-death, pro-manners, pro-freedom, anti-communism, funniest fuck meat sack that I've grown to know and love over these awesome years. Hail Nimrod. Hit me and cat up, Lucifina. We love your work. Praise Bojangles. Give my regards to the Time Suck team. Live long and suck hard, Jeff. Wow. Uh, Hail Nimrod, Jeff. Thank you for your service. So glad you're doing great. What a great message. Mentorship. Leading by example. Giving someone hope with a little time and a little money. I do love that. You know, buying someone a meal. Talk to them like they're a real human being with value. Not just looking at them like they're a fucking drag of society can go so far. Many of us have moments like that where if someone wouldn't have reached out their hand, they wouldn't be where they are now. I mean, this show is a continuation of those moments for me. Had many of you space leaders not reached out with your hands and subscriptions when you did, I would have for sure burned out and not been able to keep this up long ago. So th- that's a great message, man. Mentorship. If anybody has the time and can do that, it, it, yeah, Jeff's living proof that it can go so far to fixing lives. Another homeless update from Time Sucker, Tristan Spencer. Tristan writes, Dan, I was listening to your homeless problem in America and your solution you described is actually prison. Dependent on which prison facility you look at, there are education and work requirements. I currently live in the great state of Arizona, had the opportunity to visit a state prison as part of my major. The deputy warden told the group I was with about the variety of programs local inmates have access to. The prison has arrangements with local government and even private companies to actually send low risk inmates to work for local businesses in the Florence, Arizona area. It actually does work because businesses often hire these ex-convicts to work the same positions they were trained for. Well, thank you, Tristan. That is good to hear. Maybe we can expand this model, this already existing concept to include more mental health and drug rehab counseling. Or like you said, maybe that is even already offered there. One of these days, I need to do a prison suck to get a better understanding of our current correctional facility system. What is being offered? What can be done to improve it overall? Hail Nimrod to you. And one more. One more from Space Lizard, Ryan Patchen. And again, more homeless updates next week. So many great ones sent in. Ryan writes, good evening, your royal suckage. Your podcast is an imp- inspiration and a great joy that I appreciate immensely. I wanted to drop a few lines concerning your latest ca- uh, cast on homelessness addiction. As a space lizard who struggled greatly with opiate addiction from 20 to 27, I wanted to say that I appreciate your considerate words. Having been through the addiction and treatment, I can honestly say it was the hardest period of my life. I accept full responsibility for my behavior and actions during that time and do not try to shift the blame on others like many do. However, one item I wanted to make fellow suckers aware of is that people that people don't always talk about is post-addiction life. It's easy to assume that you have a problem, you get treatment, and then you resume your life. Although different treatments and therapy can be incredible for some more than others, one universal struggle is the years following cleaning up your act. Manipulating your brain for years with chemicals to produce raised dopamine serotonin levels isn't something that heals itself overnight. When dealing with family or friends who struggle with addiction, it's hard this to realize this, but even after being sober for weeks or months, a brain corrupted by drug abuse isn't near normal working capacity. Feelings of excitement, pleasure, etc., aren't the same as they were initially for many years to come. That being said, it's all worth it. For those out there struggling, be patient. It gets better every day. Every day is better than the next. And again, Dan Master Sucked Cummins, I thank you for your willingness to learn not just about this, but all topics you chase so that we can be more informed and entertained. You have a great position of influence and f- that few have, and I immensely respect how you handle it. Look forward to seeing you live one day. Keep on sucking. My hat's off to you, sir. Hail Lucifina, Ryan Patch in Sacramento, California. Well, Ryan, don't ever write in again. I don't like to talk to people who were uh, abusing drugs at any point during their lives. Uh, anybody who's listening, please don't. Uh, I, I don't like it. I don't care for it. So go now. Go now. Get out. Get out of here. Uh, no, of course, that's fucking ridiculous. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, that's amazing. And I love that you shared your personal story. Because that has so much more weight than anything I can share because I, I can't speak in this situation from any kind of personal place. And I love that you are living proof that it's hard, that it does get better, and that it takes a long time. Because I think, you know, we do are thankfully able to reach a lot of ears right now. And if, I mean, think about if just one of those people gets to hear your message when they need to hear it, and it makes all the difference. You know, like in other spaces mentioned earlier, you know, just they, they just need that that moment. They need that moment to kind of turn things around. And you may have just given somebody or, or several people that moment. So thanks for being an inspiration. 
Thanks for having a real insight into what it's like to live in recovery, for sharing your story. I'm so happy you slayed that dragon. Hail Nimrod to you and everyone else who writes in for being the best fucking group of people I've ever been around. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. That's all for this week, Meat Sacks. Have a great week. Don't hitchhike. Don't kill any women or kids. Don't jerk off in the street. Don't participate in secret government programs that make your dad want to kill you because you're fucking farm animals. And as Matthew McConaughey would say, all right, all right, all right. Keep on sucking. Time is a flat circle, Joe. Give me one of those nanners. Sometimes... The circle you get stuck in uh, puts you in, in a place with crunchy, squeaky <laughs> bananas. And that's what life is. Life is a series of endless, fuckable, squeak toy bananas. And it's circular and it moves and it doesn't move. And, and that's why I got to put you down. And listen, I had a small stroke about two months ago. And I don't know what I'm saying a lot of the time, but it feels in my heart like it's all right, all right, all right. 